Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the November 27th work session of the Charles County Board of Education. Can we please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, All right. Hello, Ms. Royster. Ms. Paul, how are you? Good, good. good. You got some yeah. things to share with us? Yes, we do. Please proceed. <laughs> Go and jump in. <laughs> Thanks for having us again. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get started. So, good afternoon, Chairman Lucas and um, Chairperson Moore Lee, board members, Dr. Navarro, our community, and our CCPS employees. Today, we have the opportunity again to elevate the voices and perspectives of staff, students, and families here in Charles County Public Schools who have the opportunity to participate in the Educational Equity Policy Community Surveys Part 1 and Part 2. We acknowledge the value that their voice brings and that it really does matter to the work that we all do as a school community. A special thank you to the Educational Equity Focus Group members, many who are online today watching and listening the Office of Communications and Media Relations, and the Office of Accountability regarding this true collaboration. Ms. Paul and I will share the combined survey findings today. We will also share recommendations to the board and Dr. Navarro for consideration. The board report agenda as, is as stated. It will be as follows. Agenda overview, community survey number one revisited, community survey number two results, educational equity policy recommendations, and questions for our board and Dr. Navarro. Looking at community survey number one timeline, the first community survey launched in September the 20th, September 20th, 2023. There are a number of both internal and external communications to engage our stakeholders, and the final submission, which was reported at the December meet, board meeting, um, closed on September the 29th, 2023. An outcome of the October 10th board meeting was a recommendation to share the educational equity policy to our community stakeholders a second time for additional feedback and opportunities for recommendations. The survey was launched on October 23rd and there were multiple communication efforts to share the survey with the community and the final survey submission date was October the 31st. The first question states, what describes your primary engagement with Charles County Schools? We had a total of 152 respondents who completed the combined survey. Survey one had 120 respondents, if you remember from the October board meeting, and survey two had 32 respondents. Out of the total respondents, 61.18% were family members, 28.95% were staff members, and 9.87% were students. This question states, indicate your level of agreement with the identification of the underrepresented groups. Each underrepresented group is included currently in the Educational Equity Policy 1820. 27.7% strongly disagree or disagree with the identification of the underrepresented groups. 73.2% strongly agree or agree with the identification of the underrepresented groups. This question states, which underrepresented groups is or are not included in this policy? Check all that apply. Keep in mind that within the policy, these underrepresented groups were listed. Ability, ethnicity, family structure, gender identity and expression, language, national origin, nationality, race, religion, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status. And as you can see from the information that's been provided, each group mentioned in the policy was identified as being underrepresented in the current policy, with ability groups at 14.6%, ethnic groups 12.6%, and racial groups 12.6%, stating the top three. This statement reads, please indicate your level of agreement with the following statements to the right regarding the glossary. There were two statements. The first statement reads, the glossary is helpful in communication with the community. Strongly disagreeing was 14%. Disagreeing was 19%. Agreement, 70%. And strong agreement, 22%. Making note that the majority of the respondents agreed it was helpful to have the glossary for the policy. Statement two reads, the glossary is easy to understand. 
Strongly disagree was 12 percent. Disagree, 18 percent. Agree, 77 percent. And strongly agree, 18 percent. And again, the majority of the respondents agree that the, the glossary was easy to understand as well as helpful. Okay. All right, statement reads, indicate your level of agreement with the statement on the glossary's definitions. The glossary is helpful in communication with the community and the glossary is easy to understand. 73.6% strongly agree or agree with the level of statement that glossary's definition is helpful to the community and 26.4% strongly disagree or disagree with the level of agreement that the glossary is helpful in communicating to the community. 76% strongly agree or agree with the statement the glossary is easy to understand. 24% strongly disagree or disagree that statement is glossary is easy to understand. I just did that one. Oops. There we go. Yep. The next question, the following terms will be considered by the superintendent in regards to the superintendent's rule after the information is shared today with the board and Dr. Navarro and our school community. The statement reads, if additional glossary terms are needed, please suggest them in the space below. Survey one, these terms were presented to the board during the October 2023 uh, 10th board meeting. The terms were intersectionality, neurodiversity, neuroinclusion, neuroequity, and cisgender. However, in survey two, the community recommended additional terms that are highlighted in yellow, pedagogy and special education. Okay, question. <clears throat> Do you agree or disagree with the following statements? This policy will help in addressing the existing disparities in CCPS. The second statement is this policy addresses the needs or concerns that I have for my students or as an educator in my school. 51.97% strongly agree or agree that this policy will help in addressing existing disparities and 48.04 strongly disagree or agree that this policy will help in addressing existing disparities. 48.39 strongly agree or dis strongly agree or agree that this policy addresses needs or concerns that I have for my students and or as an educator in my school. 51.55 strongly disagree or disagree that this policy addresses needs or concerns that I have for my students or as an educator in my school. Next question, is there, is there anything in this policy that is unclear to you or you need more information on? We found that the results were consistent from this timeline survey number one, and they are as follows. How is the work being done? Who is doing the work? How will the policy be measured and or tracked? Inclusion of qualitative data to ensure that we're capturing across all areas. Accountability for all, including board members. Um, supporting the implementation in terms of strategies, resources, tools, and methods. The next question is, please provide suggestions for improvement, and this was also pretty consistent um, in terms of what does justice mean in relation to school discipline and students being held accountable for violating the code, um, code of conduct, changing some definitions and um, language around professional learning, and also expanding upon what groups are actually experiencing disparities in educational outcomes and why they're experiencing those disparities. The recommendation says follows. We ask that the board approves of the revised educational equity policy 1820 and the reference terms to be included in the operational procedures in the superintendent's rule. Now we'd like to open it up to our board members and Dr. Navarro for any questions you might have. Bro, would it be possible to get the sort of talking points for slides 12 and 13 in writing to the board? I was just trying to quickly capture what was shared and I yes. to make sure I'm not missing anything. Yep, we can do that. Creamer and then Miss um, Morley. Thank you both for being here again. Good to see you, as always. Um, I just had a couple of questions. Um, the first one being, so this is something that drew my attention after the last presentation of the survey results regarding the um, groups that felt that they weren't represented. 
Um, and so I noticed that the ability group was the highest at 14.6%. Um, so that to me is significant. Um, and I think it was similar last time um, that you did the, the survey. So just curious to know if um, you had any, um, anyone from CCAC or um, Dr. McKinnon or anybody in her team that was involved in drafting the equity policy because I feel like this group is, is screaming out to us, hey, we don't feel like this policy um, applies to us. And so we wanna make sure that we're inclusive you know, particularly, you know, if it's that pronounced in the survey results. So just curious if anyone from our special education community was included in the drafting of the policy. So I'll speak to this particular revision process and then Ms. Paul can speak to the initial development of the educational equity policy. But this particular revision, uh, we did not engage those individual stakeholders that you're referring to. We did invite members of the Educational Equity Task Force to be a part of this policy revision process. And many, I won't say many, but significant um, voices at the table either have individuals that have um, special abilities that are in Charles County Public Schools or are advocates for that particular population. And so their voice was elevated during these conversations. Uh, Ms. Paul, can you speak a little bit to the initial policy and who those stakeholders were? Yes, so from the initial policy from 2019, 2020, yes, they were at the table and they helped draft the language for the policy. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, and so that leads into my next question, which was just more broad. Um, are you recommending any changes to the draft policy based on the second round of survey results? Um, the uh, great question. So the additional recommendations um, that were shared today are the, the glossary updates with the terminology that were added from survey one and survey two. Okay. And then um, I believe there were some very minor, um, I wanna say uh, grammatical edits that were recommended as well for this petitional revision uh, by the chief of schools as well. But other than those additional recommendations, it's exactly as we presented to the board today in the community. Okay, yeah. and the copy that we have, that's the most up-to-date. That is the most up-to-date revised version, Great. yes. Thank you both for that. And thank you again for the work that you've done. Um, in leading this. Appreciate you both. Great questions. To your point, Mr. Premier, and I was trying to, to look the same thing that you were asking. There, there is a slight change between this and what we saw back in September. Mm -hmm. um, I think it is mostly grammatical, but if, if you want to look at the one from September, well, I would continue. And I mean, we're not, you know, don't have to look. We're not voting this tonight, right, Mr. Schwartz? No. no. Yeah. There's one more. Yes. Okay. It, it, at the end, it, um, where it says the superintendent shall update the board on the implementation of this policy and the work of the Educational Equity Task Force Committee. It used to say regularly, now it says annually. Correct. I think that was one of the yeah. changes. Ms. Morley. Ms. Morley. Um, yes, thank you, ladies. And I echo the sentiments of uh, Ms. Kramer, very much appreciated. Ms. Kramer actually um, captured all of my questions except for one. Just generally and succinctly for the benefit of the public. If I'm understanding correctly, there wasn't a significant difference between the first and second surveys. Is that correct? correct. In terms of the general responses that you received? Correct. Was, is there anything that, that stood out to you um, between the two or do you feel like, as I, I know candidly would have hoped for more responses. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I can understand that. But For, for me, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if I showed them as Paul, but I, but I think we did in some just informal conversation was the the fact that even though the current policy had a number of underrepresented groups listed in the policy, mm -hmm. that a significant number of community members still felt that it, it wasn't adequate, it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. So that was my aha moment, that, that piece of data that bubbled up. Um, yes, so I said that for me, that's one of the biggest points I'm concerned about. Okay. Yeah. I agree, sure. repetitive, repetitive data points on, um, you know, we see um, ability groups identifier but like you said, it just keeps coming up in different words. Right. Um, so there is a big need, and not just that group, but in, in groups across the identifiers, but it, it, it sounds like there's a big need, um, and, and, and in our community is, um, they want it addressed now. Yeah. They want accountability for it now. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say the second piece is accountability across all stakeholders. Yeah. And one more minor point is, is just the, 
the idea of asking for a glossary to, to have transparency and more clarity when it comes to, you know, what does this mean, breaking it down to <coughs> conversation, to be able to say this means such and such just to talk to a neighbor. And that was something that was expressed by our focus group members as well, which were represented of our internal stakeholders and our external stakeholders. We kept hearing that as well. I had another question, but it, it, if I remember, I'll come back to it. But thank you, ladies. Ms. Butler Washington. Yes, thank you for this presentation. Um, I just wanted to, a um, little surprise, only 152 out of our whole community that uh, took this um, survey. Um, I, I say that to say that uh, it seems like a lot of our parents uh, do not take the surveys, but that does not discount uh, you know, what they're thinking <clears throat> or, you know, work time commitments and things of that nature. So, um, the information was great and I think it's, a, it's, you know, it's valuable of what we're doing. I just want to, you know, just say that, uh, with the 152 that we did have, which is important and that's why we allowed to look at the policy and make these recommendations, but it doesn't look like, um, a lot of parents, uh, take surveys that's common. And I was trying to see if it's a different way that we can um, maybe survey or ask them how would we uh, how would they like their information or their thoughts to be translated here to the school because it seems like surveys are not um, something that um, is so most popular right now for us. So just trying to look at different ways of how we can gauge those people and make sure that we you know hear from all parents at all times because of, you know, the number of people that actually take the surveys and stuff. You make a valid point because a number of our focus group members, we've had that conversation since the summer when we started um, bringing in individuals that want to be a, wanted to be a part of this process. And we talked about the benefit of focus groups and different me research methodologies that you know, kind of bubbled up. And um, so that, that has always been a consistent conversation, you know, how do we, increase voice and elevate voice in our school district on top of the survey procedure. So just know that those are conversations in, in our work that we're doing with our community. So we continue to have those discussions. Okay, thank you. Hi, Ms. Thomas. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, <clears throat> off of uh, Ms. Butler Washington's point, um, perhaps using QR codes to put these surveys in places that people are, mm -hmm may be helpful so if it's at the local health department and you just have a QR code for the time that's open they put a little thing there somebody's walking past does a QR code and then maybe they can do a survey because it's more just in time wherever you are um, than you know relying upon people to have looked at the survey gone into their email and then responded or gotten an email blast so I, I do think it's a good point of just like reaching people where they are um, I do have a question about <clears throat> The superintendent's um, necessary steps to implement the policy, well, I think it's good. Do you, have you guys envisioned any metrics that allows us to evaluate the policy if um, Dr. Navarro is gonna update us on an annual basis? The update on an annual basis is how the policy is doing, but are there metrics necessarily tied to some of these areas in the policy so that you truly know whether or not there's any benefits? You wanna speak to the initial you start and then- You, you, you sure? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, look to Ms. Paul, she's a historian <laughs> with the original policy and I came on for this, this revision. Um, I'm trying to think um, to make sure my response is, is accurate. When you say metrics, you want qualitative and quantitative or any at all if we have them as a school district? Well, I think there'll have to be a mixture of qualitative and quantitative analysis because some of it will be, you know, antidotal at best. Do you feel students, you know, or is it showing up in um, how it's being executed within the classroom mm -hmm. or within policy or, you know, in sports or, you know, in activities. So part of that, but also, you know, for example, there's one here that says provide access and opportunity for students to read on grade level by third grade. That's one grade, one point in time, but where does it go up and down the scale from then? Like, is it continuously evaluated throughout? And then how is it tied back? I mean, I just think great policy where we talk about making sure that people feel that there's some equitably and inclusion and those kind of things, but how do we know it's working with such a small survey population? Mm -hmm. are, we, are, we, are we moving the needle at all by so, putting this policy in place? 
Thanks for the clarity. So um, I, I may defer to Dr. Navarro in case I, I missed something, but the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Um, any of the departments here in Charles County Public Schools that receive any state or federal funding um, have to be aligned with either the federal regulations around educational equity or the state. You, you know this already. So from that, each of the departments, and we've had the opportunity since our department opened last year to have these conversations around assessment components. You know, how do we know that you know Comar is being um, addressed? That the regulate the regs are being addressed and so we have been in those conversations um, since last year since our department opened prior to that I could not speak to it intelligently other than at the school level but at the district level we have been because it's been an expectation and then most recently with the ESSA consolidated plan we had to provide documentation um, for systemic or system-wide strategic planning with the educational equity policy and where it showed up qualitative and quanti quantitatively both so we had to provide that um, to the state for a review so there are um, there are methods in place and have been since our department opened, but anything additional that I may be missing, Dr. Navarro, please let, let me know. Uh, Ms. Paul, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, so I think one of the ongoing conversations we've had with our focus group um, for the policy is how we're being accountable. That's come up one time and time again. And one of the projects we'll probably like to start sooner than later is to operationalize this policy, right. which means to go through the Comar um, and figure out how to put in those accountability measures, qualitative and quantitative. Mm -hmm. um, now, we don't know what that looks like as of this moment, but of course, with the direction of Dr. Navarro, um, we're hoping to, to, to materialize it and put it in front of procedures. I think that that would be great. I mean, you, we look at it from two perspectives. I'm also looking at it from, you know, the professional staff as well, because this policy includes not just students, but it also includes teachers, and there are some, um, protected groups, if I could use that term, that we necessarily don't always evaluate. So if it's gender differences, that's that's not something that comes up normally. You have, you know, you have race or you have, you know, gender, but if there's someone in some of those other groups, we don't always pull together how, how do they feel. So because we're looking at abilities and other, you know, populations, I think trying to pull those together to do a litmus test, if you will, about how the policy has affect, infected them, I think would be good. Yeah, please. So, you know, I, I, this is an interesting policy, and I will say um, the strength of this policy is the ability of everybody to hold itself accountable for the work that they're doing, um, to figure out exactly what it means for them. So I'll give you a great example. The conversation we're gonna start today on eligibility is an equity policy conversation. When I approached this um, previously uh, with the previous board, uh, and again tonight, as you guys uh, may have seen in the PowerPoint, we highlighted different um, subset of students, students with disabilities, for example. And so part of the work is, uh, and I think the strength in this policy is that every body of work in the school system needs to be looked at with an equity lens. We had a presentation about, um, uh, from human uh, resources, mm -hmm. and the question is representation. And I think part of the reason why mm -hmm. there was initial call out about identifying subgroups and showing the data in subgroups was because we struggle getting um, Asian and um, Hispanic uh, staff members to be part of our uh, staff team. We've made some strides when uh, we see representation of African American administrators, but in, in our new teacher pools, we see a lot more African American uh, representation, a little bit of Asian, a little bit of Hispanic, um, and we are also seeing representation from a whole bunch of different places in the country. So. The, I think the purpose is also how this board and how staff produces reports on any topic in the school system with an equity lens about which groups are um, traditionally underrepresented, underserved, and how do we find out about them. Some of them are trickier than others too. I think the conversation needs to happen about how are we doing with our student outcomes, our staff retention, um, we are going to get data on staff retention probably in like two months or so from the state. When we come back to you and present that to you, who are we retaining? Who are we losing? Why are we losing them? Um, and so I think the, the, the question here is, 
the the comfort level of this board saying do we have a policy with the right language that gives the message to the entire system that the body of work that we should be doing in any body of work where um, how we grow how do we uh, build facilities renovate facilities should be looked at with an equity lens and i think that's that's the the question on the policies because then the board can say and as they sort of monitor themselves on the effectiveness of 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 um of their policies can also say well the information that we're not that we're getting doesn't have an equity lens in this way or that way um, when staff come and report on it or the way we report certain things and and this is work that we all need to do we're not perfect at this but I think that's the that's the the view that we should need to strive for um, on all aspects you're about to get a presentation on the budget um, and in a in a couple of months and then my question is going to be i'm looking at it with what's the equity lens there for resources for students what does that look like um, so hopefully it's difficult because it can be a very long policy it can be a very short policy the question is is the board how does the board feel about sending a message to the community that it, it is in its expectations to see a policy lens in every aspect of the work that we do. And you know, you'll always hear from me, how do we know it's happening? We somehow codify it through some data lens, as you mentioned, Ms. Thomas. Anyone else? Um, Dr. Navarro made me think about something and then it made me think about, thought about the, uh, when you have the third grader now. Um, it was a documentary I looked at uh, where it says that um, this school to prison pipeline, this is a great policy for that. Uh, that doesn't have a race on it. It says if students who have not, uh, is not on grade level at third grade, that's when the state start building prisons. So this policy alone will help us identify those students and bring them up so we can change the directory of what is happening in today's world. So as I look at this policy, um, I look at it as we're going to give more emphasis on third graders, identify them early when they are not on task from kindergarten, first to second, third. And just like uh, Board Member Thomas said, that uh, we can also, you know, look at them when they get to sixth grade, or maybe, you know, make uh, expand the policy out. But this is a great policy because you're jumping right on to what it already said it was going to be. So we are attacking it early and we're doing it faced on. So I do love this policy simply because of that, because you identifying, we talk about it, we see all these uh, studies on these things, but we're doing something about it. We're actionable. We're actually putting something in place so we in Charles County can prevent some of those uh, trials that come down for a lot of people in the world and Charles County is included into that, but we are, you know, going forth with it. So thank you for that. Thank you. Ms. Morley. Yes, ladies, one uh, quick um, thought. I know that um, there are several populations that, you know, candidly, even in light of the sadly low responses, still glaringly don't feel seen in this. Um, just a suggestion to figure out how we may be able to incorporate them going forward, maybe in the annual updates. And this may be more of a suggestion for Dr. Navarro. Um, to Ms. Kramer's point, using CCAC maybe as one example. Um, if they either are helping to collect data, because I know oftentimes that, that is where parents go when they don't feel seen for whatever reason. So. Um, just fleshing it out as, a, as, as we speak, but <laughs> just a thought, maybe some of those groups, and to your point, Dr. Navarro, where we, we have um, the obvious gaps, I don't know what that might look like in terms of maybe having um, like a base such as it were or a starting point, some, some kind of central point of contact for the areas where people are consistently telling us I don't feel seen, I don't feel heard. In particular, it, it concerns me about the, the people that are differently abled. That, that's really, really troubling. So I'm happy to discuss offline as, you know, still fleshing it out, but just, just a thought about how we can make sure that if, if we're either gonna do this fully or not at all, and clearly we're committing to doing this fully. So 
I'd like to see everyone, I'd like to see those numbers decrease and everyone at least, even if it's not ideal or perfect, but they understand that they're, they're significant as part of our population, that their voices matter, that, you know what I mean? Like, I really want them to understand that it, it's not something that we just say, okay, well, only five or 10% of the population feels that way. To me, that still warrants some kind of, response. you know, response, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again for the presentation. I was, you know, on slide 11, I know you talked about this a little bit, but, you know, pretty much split in half about people agreeing whether whether the policy would address their, their concerns and um, certainly like to see that higher. But I think really that's just the artifact of, of the fact that there's, you know, 10 or 11 areas where, where people were feeling that, going back to slide seven, you know, what under represented group isn't included in that policy, it just spread so thin. And for most people, right, it's one or two areas that they're focused on. And so you're, you're, you're just not gonna get, you know, that, that level of satisfaction overall because everybody has that one thing, that litmus test for them, that no matter if it's 90% good, that 10% is all I care about. So I think that, you know, I, I'm saying all that to say don't, don't, <coughs> Don't be that discouraged that it's only 52% and 45% because, again, I think that's everyone with their little niche. And to Ms. Morley's point, it's not that we're going to ignore it. We just have to drill down further and see how we can get, you know, more respondents and, and, and more groups to weigh in on what can be done. So thank you again. Nice stuff as always. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Paoli? I gotta make sure I'm going the right way. Yeah, I'm ready. All right, and good afternoon, Board Chair Lucas, Board Vice Chair Moore Lee, Board Members, Dr. Navarro, and staff. All right, so um, I have with me this afternoon uh, Mr. Richard Paule. Uh, he is the director for activities, student activities, athletics, and aquatics. And I'm Marvin Jones, of course, I'm chief of schools. And so uh, we are going to share an information item with you tonight regarding um, our extracurricular and eligibility requirements. So uh, I'll let you go ahead and click there, Ms. Paoli. Um, Actually, you can go ahead and start. Yep. All right, so we'll fill you in on the, the current policy as, as it's written. Uh, students are promoted from 8th to ninth grade. Their students, when they're promoted from 8th to ninth grade, automatically meet the eligibility requirements for the first semester uh, of high school. Uh, beginning in the second semester, which is after quarter two, students must have earned a 2.0 grade point average from the second quarter with no failing grades and may not have more than four and a half unexcused absences. Uh, eligibility for each quarter thereafter is determined is based on the GPA, the report card grades, and attendance standing of the previous quarter. So for the spring sports, just to give you an example, it's going to be from quarter two and into quarter three as well. Uh, beginning in the third quarter, students may be eligible with no more than, oh, excuse me, recommended changes, I'm sorry. Beginning in the third quarter, students may be eligible with no more than one failing grade uh, if GPA requirements are met, and again, those are a 2.0. Beginning in the third quarter, attendance limitations or requirements will be eliminated. Uh, some notable facts here that I pulled from uh, the 24 local education systems. Uh, 18 systems in Maryland have a 2.0 GPA requirement. Uh, which is where we are at right now. Uh, that is 18 out of 24. That's roughly 75%. There are four systems in Maryland that have no GPA requirement. There are 13 systems in, in Maryland allowing one failing grade, which is 54%. And there are two systems in Maryland that allow two failing grades. And there is one system that has an attendance component as a part of the eligibility for extracurricular activities, and that is Charles County. All right, so... Talking about changes, 
really is what we are here to talk about, right? Proposed changes or to make recommended changes. And so uh, you heard the two items that Mr. Felder, uh, Mr. Paolet, uh, um, you heard what he talked about as far as what we'd like to, to see changed. And so what we wanted to do was to share just a little bit of uh, data that we think would be uh, important for you to, to know about. And so if we can just go through this, and I'll try to, um, I guess, to bring some clarity to, to these numbers here. So the light blue um, row across is for last, last year, obviously, and then the orange one or whatever color that is is for this year. And so all for the first quarter. So we're just talking about the first quarter. So to explain what we have, if you're looking at under where it says quarter one eligibility status based on current policy, that's the left um, column you see, and there's an ineligible column and the eligible column. So last year, first quarter, we had 69.8% of our students who were eligible. And that is based on um, the current policy that we have in place, right? And so this year, first quarter, based on the current policy, we have 69, first quarter, 69% of our students who were eligible. So that's current. So as we look at what we are proposing, the changes that we are proposing going across now, so we have asked for the attendance requirement to be eliminated. So for example, if there were no attendance requirement last year, uh, for first quarter, instead of having 69.8% of our students eligible, we would have had 74% of our students eligible if there were no attendance requirement. If there were, if the, we did allow uh, one failing grade last year, instead of 69.8% eligible, we would have had 75.6% of our students who would have been eligible uh, first quarter. And then to combine them all, uh, we would have gained uh, last year, first quarter, would have gained about 1,122 more students. And so um, from 69.8% of our students being eligible first quarter last year, if we were, if we had our changes in place, we would have had 81.8% of our students eligible first quarter last year. And so this year, first quarter, similar numbers. Um, again, 69% 69 of our students were eligible first quarter. Um, if we did not have the attendance, eligible, attendance uh, requirement there, we would have um, added 452 more students, which would have been uh, almost 74% of our students, again, eligible with the attendance. Um, same, another 533 students if we uh, allowed one failing grade. And again, um, about 1,100 students we would have added if the changes we're proposing uh, were in place for this quarter would have had instead of 69% we would have had 80.7% um, that's all students uh, but we did take a look at this and you heard Dr. Navarro mention a little bit about equity and um, access um, to opportunities we looked at it for a couple of our major uh, subgroups special education being a pretty important one again the light blue um, row across is the same last year just as the last chart um, the other one is from this year for first quarter. Uh, last year we had 54.3 students eligible. And then going all the way across, if we were, um, if what we were proposing was in place last year, we would have had, instead of 54% of our students, would have had 71.2%. And this year, similarly, um, we started well, this quarter, first quarter, we had 51.7 of our uh, special education students eligible. And going all the way across, we would have added another 117 students. So 63.9% uh, of our special education students would um, have been eligible with the proposed changes for this year. And the same with our students who are on free or reduced meals. Uh, again, eligible last year, 57.5. Going all the way across, we would have had 73. Um, this year, 57% of our farm students were eligible first quarter. Going all the way across with the proposed changes in place, we would have had 71.1% of our students um, who would have been eligible for this quarter. Uh, what you see up here is the Maryland high school eligibility of all 24 uh, school districts and their policies. Um, you can see at the top that Charles County is uh, the highest with a 2.0 GPA, no failing grades, um, and an additional uh, attendance requirement that goes along with it. 
Um, you can kind of see everything in the green and the blue there that, that has, we're sitting right around that 2.0. The green is no more than one failing grade, um, and the blue below it is just a, a 2.0 GPA. Uh, the next slide is the eligibility requirements that not only are met for athletics, but they have to be met for students who participate in competitions that are non-curricular performances and, act and in activities which represent a CCPS school or district. Activities include, but are not limited to, I don't want to read all of them to you. Those are in our athletic handbooks as well. <laughs> I'm sure you can all read those. <laughs> And not just sports, just something that's worth mentioning. CCPS eligibility policy does not only affect athletics. You just saw that from the last slide. Um, there are multiple uh, two to things on there, like step team, POMS, model UN, mock trial, it's academic, things like that. Any and all ex extracurricular opportunities whereby high school students officially compete, perform, and or represent Charles County. Public schools, they require strict compliance with the eligibility policy unless participation is required via instructional class enrollment. If you need an example, that's something like a band or chorus concert and or syllabus expectation from their class. And so to um, wrap this up, we thought we'd offer just a little bit of commentary here that's um, uh, food for thought, if you will. Our goal is to uh, provide more accessible opportunities for our students to be eligible to participate in uh, sports or extracurricular activities. Um, regardless of who they are and what group they belong to. Um, and certainly while the consistent sustainment of holding high standards for participants of extracurricular activities of the years is acknowledged as having the very best of intentions, uh, we certainly respect um, how our board got us to this point. We respect it and honor it and appreciate it. Um, but as we look at some of the numbers and we think about some of the opportunities that may be missed, um, it is something that we do think is important for us to really think about, talk about, consider, um, and maybe even um, offer some revisions. Um, additionally, not only are um, we the most stringent district in the state of Maryland as far as uh, K-12, uh, but we are stricter than many of the NCAA Division I um, schools, colleges. Uh, so, um, so maintaining high standards is uh, unquestionably important. Um, and absolutely necessary, we all believe in that. Um, but uh, when you look a little deeper, you know, we, we do ask ourselves at, at what opportunity costs and who might we be missing. And so our thought is that it's time to broaden our perspective just a little bit. We are prepared to open it up for questions, but I will offer just before we do that, um, just a couple of um, examples, if you will. Um, that were not, uh, we didn't pull this in time for it to be a part of um, what you have before you, but um, for this quarter, if it's um, of interest to you, uh, we had 44 students who had a 4.0 with no failing grades, but they had more than five absences and were ineligible. Um, there's several that I have here, but just a couple of the, a couple to note. We had 120 students who had a 2.75 GPA with no attendance concerns and one failing grade, not eligible for this year. Uh, 59 of our students had a 3.0, no attendance, one failing grade, not eligible. Uh, 20 students with 3.25 or higher, no attendance, one failing grade. So we have a few examples of students who um, you know, missed that opportunity. They, um, and, and so we don't know whether or not they would have wanted to participate. We, we didn't track down exactly who they are and talk to them, um, but the numbers are, are certainly um, compelling um, to some degree, and so we thought that it, 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 it is time to have that discussion again. So we are prepared for questions. Thank you, Dr. Jones. I just want to make sure I understand this. Because when I first read it, uh, I said, well, that sounds kind of odd. When you say from third quarter onward, that's onward forever, not just the third quarter of every year. That's for the incoming freshmen because they are eligible for the first two quarters. Um, slide. Which slide are you talking about? So, so slide three. 
for, for no, actually for both of them. So both of them start off by saying beginning third quarter. Yeah. So I think I think the inference there is beginning third quarter of this year. That's okay. that, that's everybody, but it's it's because of the eighth graders that have been promoted to ninth grade. They have they are eligible for the first semester. Third quarter of the semester. The first understand. semester. Yes, ma'am. Un, un, understand, but but that first bullet, if if the board were to accept the change. So, so it would I, be it would be no no failing grade from the third quarter of this year. So no, forward. so no, so so the, the the changes that we are recommending are for next school year, so starting school year 23, 24, 25. So it's not for this, the rest of this school year. That's what you're asking. No. No. Okay. So so, so the way the way this says it says beginning third quarter students may be eligible with no more than one failing grade. So let, let, let let's suppose we took. We the, let's support the let's suppose the board adopted gotcha. this. Okay. okay. So, um, for the next school year, they could have a failing grade any time of the year. Correct. Not not just starting the third quarter. That is correct. Thank you. Yes. I, I, that's that's. Okay. After I read, it, that's what I thought you meant. It's just that it was okay. a little confusing. The so way. So when it's time, we'll be sure to clear that up. Okay. Because I can see now where that question came from. All right. Absolutely. Perfect. All right. So. We're going to start with Ms. Warren. Yeah, could you repeat what you just asked again so I can hear that again? <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. No, just so when I, when I first read that, I, I, I took it as every school year, mm -hmm. starting in the third quarter, students would be eligible if they had a failing grade. But that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is if, if the board w would, were to adopt the recommendations, mm -hmm. then starting the third quarter, well, uh, any time, any time during the school year, not just starting the third quarter, that a student could have a failing grade and still be eligible. Mm -hmm. But just for ninth graders, correct? Y yes, the third so quarter is because of the ninth grade policy with the first semester being eligible. Ninth grade comes in I, eligible up through the end third. of second quarter. Well, no, I think, I think this is for any grade level. And it will be when the changes put in place yeah yeah if. so if i so maybe i i, yeah. I can um offer a recommendation so yes. i think you could read slide three saying recommended changes for ninth graders yep. because the ninth graders their first semester is yeah the, you're eligible okay. so beginning third quarter you know um that would be our recommendation and imagine a duplicate um slide but take out the word beginning third quarter for both of those bullets, and that is also our, requ our, recommend, our uh, recommended change to you, saying any student, 10th, 11th, or 12th graders, would be eligible um, with no more than one failing grade um, and, their GP and meeting their GPA requirement of, of uh, 3.0. 2.0, excuse me. And, um, and then that the attendance limitations or the attendance requirement would be eliminated. So that would be for all students. It's just that this one specifically talks about beginning third quarter because it really should, should say recommended changes for ninth graders. And then another one would just say for everybody else. Okay. So my, um, thank you for that clarification, I think. No. <laughs> but um, my question, so the teacher in me is screaming like, I oh, know. Um, so you kind of answered my question when you said something about um, when you read those examples at the end yes. that some of those students who have 4.0s um, but missed five days or more of school, they yeah. were not eligible. But you, did, you said that you weren't sure if those kids actually wanted to participate in extracurricular activities. So, so we haven't asked these students um, you know, whether or not they would have participated in something or not. Uh, what we know is who would be able to if they wanted to. Right. Um, so, so you know, could, could we speculate? Perhaps, but we really don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but just to give the numbers of who would have been eligible or was not eligible this. Yeah, because my my question was, uh, was there any connection between the lack of attendance and that failing grade? You know, how kids miss school, mm -hmm. they miss an assignment, they fail. Some in some cases, some instances. Do you, is, was there any relation to that between attendance and a failing grade and or GPA? Um, well, 
that, that, that's, that's hard to say. Um, I, I, I suspect that um, it, with many of these, it's simply um, a class that some of the ones just, just struggle, just to, you know, we, we know there are some mm -hmm. that have struggled in an AP class, all the other classes that they've done really well. Um, but that particular one is one that they just are having a hard time. Um, and so, but, but we haven't done enough research to correlate whether or not um, the ones that do have the attendance concerns, and the attendance concerns were not super high. The, the ones that I, I, I mentioned, um, the 44 students with a 4.0, no failing grades, um, their attendance was between five and 7.5. So you can't have more than 4.5. Mm -hmm. So they had somewhere between five and 7.5 days they were out that quarter um, that was an excuse. And so, and, and for, for a couple of these. And so, um, so, so we don't, we, we didn't really do the correlation on it. Again, I didn't even have this ready for, for docs. Um, and I can share it with you afterwards, but, but we just pulled out some examples because we wanted to get an idea. How many students are we talking about? That, that where attendance may have held them back from being eligible or, or students who um, you know, didn't or had one F. Um, and so, so several more of those that I didn't even mention um, that were in that boat. 20 students with 3.25, um, no attendance. Seven students with 3.5 or higher, no attendance issues, one F on a report card. So, so there are a number. Um, 114 students had five unlawful absences, only five. So. Yeah, I was going to ask that. That was my next question. Mm -hmm. Are these excused absences? How does that play in the factor of, you know, um, attendance and all that? They're listed as unlawful absences. Unlawful in the data absences. So if yes. they're unlawful, then that's when that yes. policy issue comes right. in. Um, I didn't know. I think times have changed. Because I didn't know you could get still get a three-point anything and have an F. So that's yes. that, that yeah. matrix. Well, I'd be interested to see. The classes are weighted heavier than okay, others. Okay, the, the yeah. weight. Right, oh, right. Uh, it's not uncommon. You know, right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Ms. Thomas. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> um, I'm glad to see that you guys did a lot of innovative work on trying to come up with policy and comparison. I was happy to see that you talked about the NCAA re requirements. Um, as a former NCAA Division I athlete, I definitely understand what those requirements are, um, what it takes for kids to get through the clearinghouse in order to be um, eligible <coughs> Some of the classes that they are being scrutinized for or failing are not even classes that count towards their ability to even get an NCAA scholarship. So I think those are critical things. We have um, some students that, I, I don't know, I, I had a kid who failed television and film, right? But it made him ineligible to play. He was just taking a class and he was like, oh, it's movies, I'm gonna just write papers. It, it ended up being different, right? And it made him ineligible. So I think I have a, a lot of questions about data because data tells me a lot. <clears throat> the farms data is very telling um, because when we talk about this policy and what it's doing, we talk about numbers and overall students, but I would like to dig into the data to see what groups are impacted. I would like to know what's happening from a gender perspective. Um, I like to see that you had the <clears throat> the special education students. Um, as we know, they are heavily impacted at times with the inability to participate because they struggle a little bit more in school. So if we could um, dig into that data more, I think that would be really helpful. Um, and one of the things that I would like to know is that we, have we considered having a committee, um, the same as we have for like naming a school or other things, um, because I'd like to know what students think. We are adults sitting in a room talking about things that impact students' futures. They're the athletes, they're the, the players, they're the thespians, they're the, and I, I think asking the students, I don't know, um, I think we should include them, right? Because um, there's a lot of people who say, well, school should be important, and it is important, but if you take yourself back to 15 and 14 or whatever your age was, was your sport more important? Um, I think that would help us determine what motivates them to participate, sometimes the sport or the band or whatever is motivating for those students. So I would like to see us ask parents or um, coaches. We have some, you know, coaches or, or local people in the area. Um, so if we can find a way to include students. I would love to have the students' voice in this. I think it's important, and I think it would be valuable. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the other thing that I, I wanted to note here is um, 
how is this monitored? Because I am certain um, that the monitoring matters. Um, because if it's football or basketball or a sport, I'm certain someone is like, coach, your kid is failing. But I don't know if somebody's going to the cheerleading coach and the debate team and saying, you got to fail a kid too. So I would really like to see us have something in the policy about some monetization of this or making sure that it's monitored if there isn't something like, is there something people are putting in or is it just you take a little sheet and you take it to your, you know, your coach and then you take it to your, because who knows that that's really happening, which means again, we have some impacted groups of students. Ms. Thomas, can I just pause you there? Because I, I would like my staff to be able to respond to that. Actually, Mr. Paoli's job before he got this uh, fancy gig was to uh, make sure that that the eligibility was run. We have a report and we have a process. I just want him to give you the opportunity to discuss how we do that at every school. Yeah, so there, there's several coaches. If you, if you go back a couple years ago before we had the new student information system, which is Synergy, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of those coaches, there would be that sheet where you right. had to go around and sometimes you couldn't practice or you couldn't play the next game unless you had all of those grades in. With the student information system, as long, you know, they can, they can check those grades. I know for a fact that I would put my coach listed under there, under Synergy, they got to see every single person that was on their team and their grades and they were all as live as can be. Um, so if a teacher had updated that morning, they could see that grade right away. And it's for every, because we, we have a lot of activities listed here. Like, is the key club, is somebody monitoring the key club the same way yes, they monitor the Yes, everything that team? involves eligibility goes into the student information system. And so there's a difference between eligibility to play and those, I guess, grades at interim, you know, and sometimes it's like your interim grade or, like, how, how are interim grades played into this factor, right? Because what, the old policy, I think, like, let's say you got a failing grade in the last quarter, then you're not eligible the next fall, right? Right. Right. So uh, the interim grades as well as summer school. Right. How do we because I feel like there needs to be some redemption for kids and I don't in the, the current policy. There is no redemption. Right. You're kind of stuck. If you play football and you fail, football only comes around once a year. You're stuck. Right. And so I would just like to to like see how we can interweave redemption qualities from summer school or some other things in the policy as well. If I can answer that for you, in the athletic handbook right now, um, we passed it a few years ago where students that aren't eligible can still participate in off-season activities. And that was one of the biggest, the exact reason why you asked that question is the reason why we put it in is so that we can capture those kids who aren't doing so well. They can be in the weight room. They can participate in off-season conditioning. And at the same time, they can monitor them, not during the actual fall season or whatever season it is that they're playing. But they still miss their opportunity to play sports, which in they high school is it's huge, them. right? You miss, a year, you miss a year of your sport. That impacts your ability to be in your class and get recruited. Like, so I just really would like us to be uber thoughtful about including the student's voice and making sure that we allow students to redeem themselves in a whole quarter or a whole semester is a long time. And I would like to see us incorporate those things. So, so I guess I have a question at this point. Um, are you um, suggesting that these are some changes that we go back and put into the, the next time we present? Because um, I hear what you're saying that, you know, as it stands right now, students who go to summer school, um, they, they, they can't, can't earn eligibility back if they have failed right. this spring. Um, even if they, they pass the class, that's just not what we have in place right now. But is a suggestion Absolutely. that something like that is incorporated into, and I guess that is um, if that's the will of the board, then we certainly, if that's how this works, we certainly can um, incorporate that into the adjusted um, revision that we bring back for next month. So Sure. I think, you know, we'll capture all these. I'm sure there'll be other comments from board members. Okay. But that's a very good point. And particularly now since we've, we've really opened up the aperture on what we offer in summer school and we've seen the response to that, you know, there ought to be some opportunity. To, uh, and there's greater opportunity for kids to, to make up for stuff. So Ms. Thomas's point is well taken. Yeah. I, I, and um, uh, yeah, like a probationary period, like some, something that allow, like, I just think kids need to have redemption, right? We, we hold our, our kids to a very high standard, and I would just venture to say none of us in this room is perfect, and neither are students. So we need to give them the opportunity 
you know, like you said, they can go in the weight room, but maybe you can't go to games until you, you know, there's some other things that I think could be involved in the way we look at the policy. Appreciate Thank it. you. Happy to be here, though. Thank you. Miss Thomas in the purple jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Anything? Yeah. <laughs> You're good? Okay, Ms. Smith. Uh, so one, definitely appreciate the, the sentiments of um, my colleague, Ms. Thomas, as I believe probably the only D1 athlete on this board, um, and, and also someone who had a child who was an athlete who was impacted by this policy. So definitely appreciate your comments. So thank you for sharing. Um, definitely thank you to Dr. Jones and Mr. Paolet. Paolet. Okay. Paolet. <laughs> Apologies, sir. Mr. Paolet. Um, this presentation was very well done. Um, definitely appreciate the notable facts and looking at some of our sister counties, because that's definitely one of the questions that I was going to inquire in terms of how do we stand in comparison to our sister counties. So thank you for bringing forth that data. Uh, also appreciate the equitable look and thinking about our students with disabilities as well as our free and reduced um, meal students. Uh, definitely shows that you know your board and the questions that we would have raised. So appreciate you anticipating that. I only have one question which really speaks to, um, is there a way, so I, I've heard the superintendent talk much about productive struggle, and I love that term, I love that phrase. I love what we're trying to do in the county in terms of elevating and raising the bar for what the opportunities that our students have academically, and never wanting to sort of shy away from that, but also recognizing the role that sports and sort of extracurricular activities plays in our students' lives. So I, I understand that balance. I'm curious about, has there been any thought around requiring tutoring? Right now, it's an option. You know, we have the, the contract with FEVS tutoring from that, I think that's the acronym, FEV? Mm -hmm. FEVS is something totally different, different job. Um, <laughs> wrong job. You got me? Okay. But we, we have the contract with the tutoring firm, and right now it's optional for students to opt in should they feel they need some additional support. But for our, extra, our students who are kind of participating in these extracurricular activities, if they are slipping behind, is this something that we can require them to participate in, in addition to kind of trying to keep them on track with their um, sport or after school, before school activity of their choice? Just curious if any thought was given to that of, or what wrinkles that might so, so it's not something that, that I'm aware has come up as far as a required mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, certainly, tutoring is always encouraged um, when you know, there, there's, there's recognition that some students need uh, that extra support. Um, and then, uh, obviously, you know, bringing students in and coaching them themselves and mentoring. And coaches will do that. Teachers will do that. Um, but requiring it, um, I don't think that's something that we've um, talked about before. Um, so certainly, that's, that's something that I think we can... We can talk about if that was a stipulation would there be any concerns or pushback from like parents or students to remain you've dipped below your failing classes your grade point average is beginning to slip we recognize the importance that this sport plays in your life you're now required to go to tutoring if you'd like to remain on the team like would there be any concerns and kind of re requiring that level of engagement so we'll, we, I mean, it's just free. So I, I don't. Uh, I mean, I think that free. that could be a barrier if the, if it were. Sure, yeah, but but FEV, we're we're paying for it. I think. Yeah, I I think. Appreciate the point. I think the term requiring might might get a little touchy because you could have another student that wasn't playing a sport, and you're not going to tell them. Hey, you're required to go to a tutor. We're only going to focus on on kids that are. Mm -hmm. Only if you want to play sports, uh, or, or extra, whatever extra. No, but, but, but what I'm saying, but, 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 but my team, point is, my, my my point is, you have students that are failing, and you're not going to require them to have tutoring simply because they're not in an extra activity. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem to be right either. So I'm not disagreeing with you, but no, just no, say, hey, that. this is this is here for you. You know, we're not saying you got to do it, but belly up. It's there for free. Yeah. No, I, I hear you. I mean, I would like to see if it's possible for us to require it. Yeah. Definitely here where there might be some pushback since for students who aren't mm -hmm. seeking those extra activities. I cannot say that word tonight. I don't know Conditional. Why. Exactly. Conditional. Yeah. I like it. So just curious. Mm -hmm. That was my only question. Thank you. Okay. Do you have a comment on that? Or we're just, yeah, I'm just sure. going to work, we're just going to work our way around unless okay, you have a comment for that. Go. Go. Go, go ahead. Yes, thank you both for being here. Um, I really appreciate this. Um, I, I was like Miss Thomas over here. Um, the, the, the 
other Miss Thomas, Miss S. Thomas. I don't know. What, <laughs> um, we're going to get this figured out. We're going to get this figured out. Um, that I was so excited because um, team sports are huge. Um, I'm a huge proponent of team sports. I'm a huge um, supporter of team sports, and I know um, the impact that it has on kids. Um, and I participated in team sports all through my youth and in high school, and so did my older kids. And, um, you know, have one who did athletics and one who was like key club, SGA, all that. Mm -hmm. But same eligibility policy applied to both of them. Um, and just know the impact that it makes and in and, and so many things, right, um, in terms of creating a package if they want to go on to college, you know, um, showing that they're, you know, versatile and well-rounded, that they can participate in sports and participate in clubs and still, you know, do fairly well in academics. Um, so just a couple of things that I noted. Um, one, for the benefit of the public, just to understand that, the, again, this is not just athletics, right? So, you know, when people hear this, they think, oh, well, no, you can't play football or basketball if, you know, you don't get a certain, you know, GPA or if you get a failing grade. But this means clubs, organizations, you know, so many more things than just traditional athletics that most of the time when people hear eligibility policy, that's what they think about. So I just want to make sure that that's clear, you know, to the public. Um, about that and or who's impacted and how many clubs and organizations that this impacts we'll put some of them back up in case the public's viewing <laughs> yes absolutely for all of our millions of viewers yes. like Dr. Yeah. Navarro always yeah. says um, the set yeah absolutely um, the second point that I want to make um, and Ms. Thomas did point this out as well is that um, you know the farms data had the most significant uh, impact and that says a lot to me um, and I think to a lot of us, you know, that those students who qualify um, for free and reduced meals are, would be the most impacted. And, um, you know, the, the eligibility would increase the most to capture more of those students should they wish to participate. And that was really telling for me. Um, in addition to that, um, in most categories that you presented, which again, to Ms. Smith's point, this was so well done because you really did anticipate, because the first thing I thought about when I saw it on the agenda, I said, how many students would be impacted if we changed the rules? And then there you have it, it's in there. Um, and I noticed that over 10% or more in every category, um, and that's huge, that's significant um, to me. So I think um, just some things to consider is that I think in the past and traditionally, we look at eligibility pol policies like you do well in academics, and then you get to participate in sports or extracurriculars. But for some students, doing well in, or participating in extracurriculars motivates them or makes them want to do well in school or it improves their, their morale or improves their attitude towards school or the school community in general. Um, and I know, you know, Mr. Pale, know, you know, we're familiar with each other and you know that I have a lot of friends who are coaches. And I know that the last time this came up, you know, um, they were in support of, of you know, sort of um, relaxing the policy a bit because they know the students that would be impacted. And some, for some kids, you know, the relationships they build with their teammates and the relationships they build with their coaches um, make a huge impact in their life and they wouldn't have those relationships outside of sports. And so if we can capture more kids who this would make a huge impact in their lives overall it's more than just playing sports or participating in a club you know i think you know this is something that i would have to be in support of for sure so thank you again for thank this you. mr hancock thank you chairman thank you both for the presentation i do have a few questions um so i was a part of the last board that um lowered the um gpa requirement and i reluctantly agreed to that to lower the gpa requirement from a 2.5 to a 2.0 and during that time i remember very uh, vividly that we were told that if we lowered these um, standards that we would see increases in in grades and increases in attendance and behaviors would improve so i'm my question is do we have any data to see if making that uh, change in gpa from a 2.5 to a 2.0 is there any data that shows that grades, attendance, and behaviors have improved for those students that um, were previously ineligible and became eligible? So I'll, I'll say that I, I believe we could pull that data. First, we did go from the 2.25 to the mm -hmm. 2.0. Um, I think you mentioned 2.5, so I just want to be sure we're, 
no, no worries. Um, but um, but we didn't we didn't bring that data or, or put it in this presentation. Um, I think we could we could do some research there and and, and see. Um, uh, I didn't necessarily remember that that particular statement, but certainly something we can take a look into. Sure. See. Well, thank you. Um, and have we also so I have a couple of questions here? Um, have we considered the possible unintended consequences, um, such as right now we have students who currently struggle, but put in the extra work to meet the requirements to be eligible. Um, we have students who attend school just to be eligible. Um, we have students who may be on the verge of failing a class, but knowing that that will make them ineligible, they work hard to, to maintain, maintain that eligibility status. It's my fear that if we if we lower this standard and lower these requirements to be eligible, that those students may not work as hard, that we are gonna see an increase in absences and an increase in failing grades. Um, is, is that something that has been thought of? Well, we haven't talked about it, but, but I, what I will say about the attendance piece is um, while we will I mean, if, 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 it, if it passes, um, we will uh, eliminate the attendance piece as far as eligibility goes. Um, I, I think there will probably be some serious discussions on how far we want to go with still allowing students to participate as they normally would if they're not in school that day. For example, if they're not in school on a particular day that's game day, I think they, they can't play or they have to be in there for a part of the day. Um, half the day in order to participate. There, there may be some things that we need to take a look at in that regard um, that, that may not necessarily be completely tied to the policy. Um, so, but again, we haven't, you know, it's hard to say a whole lot. We haven't had those discussions. So the information that you share is certainly good for us to, to you know, have some further discussion um, in preparation for the changes if they do get passed. Okay. And one last thing, you know, it's, it's, and I know these are tough questions, but this is, I heard a lot of uh, people that were upset when we made just that little touch from the 2.25 to the 2.0 GPA a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And one thing that really was a comment that I heard and I can actually resonate with, you know, is it, it's, it's our mantra to produce students that are career and college ready. Um, the attendance issue is something that really stands out to me because that's not something that reality looks in a positive way. You know, once you graduate high school, we're dealing with young adults in, at this age in, in high school, and in just a few short years, they're going to be joining the workforce, or they're going to be uh, attending college, or, or perhaps the, the military. And there will be very strict standards on having to, to show up and, and at least be there. You know, if you're there and you show up and try, that, that carries a lot of weight in a lot of things. And if you work for someone and you don't show up, well, you're not going to have a job very long. Um, I, I, I just think that eliminating the um, attendance requirement altogether could set students up for failure in the long run when they leave, leave Charles County Public Schools. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a perspective that is um, well received. Um, I, I think it would behoove us that if we remove that this particular part of the, the policy to ensure that um, that doesn't mean that we condone that students don't come to school. Some of it will be, you, you spoke about uh, unintended consequences. Some of the students who, if they decide not to keep coming to school, then their grades are going to suffer. Um, that's, that's just a fact. You've got to be here to... To, to do as well as what you possibly can. And so some of that would come into play, um, but certainly we, we, we wouldn't, um, I guess, promote that, you know, you don't have to be here type of type of deal. That certainly wouldn't be the case. We still would, I mean, those are life lessons, like you said. Um, we still would impress upon our students. I, I would think that it's important to show up uh, because this is pre preparing you for uh, the next level, not, not just getting out of high school, um, you do have to show up to work. And so, so, you know, so those are the kinds of things that we certainly would still promote. Um, again, not necessarily tied to the policy, but it wouldn't mean that we um, condone kids just not coming to school. Uh, we certainly would continue to fight, you know, that battle as well. So. That's all I have. I appreciate it. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you both. Thanks. Ms. Morley. Yes, thank you both um, for this presentation. I know there 
many of us that feel very strongly and several of us that have children currently in Charles County Public Schools. And as always, these, this would impact our own children. So we always have that in the back of our mind. I can use one example. Uh, my daughter at 16 had a knee replacement and was on crutches for quite a while. It was incredibly painful for her. And she's not an athlete, it's, it's not her gift, but she is very, very connected and was connected to SGA, to Model UN, to French Club, to other things, and that kept her going. So for me, we cannot ever underestimate the importance of the children's mental health and what these types of things do. And I know we've heard a lot about that athletics, but it's well beyond that for many students because for those who are not athletes, this is their outlet. This is their opportunity to connect with their peers, to build relationships with you know, the, the teachers, with the coaches, and also to candidly, for many of them, have a safe space for whatever they may be going through. And then even well beyond just college, these are life skills that they're learning. And part of that is, you know, to your point, because I can, I can imagine playing devil's advocate, a parent saying, well, what's my incentive then for my child to show up if there is no attendance requirement? Well, you still are going to at some point be facing truancy. So it's not like, you know, we're saying, well, don't ever show up to school at all and there won't be any consequences. But perhaps, just throwing it out there, we could maybe meet in the middle instead of no attendance requirements. Perhaps we could increase the amount of allowable absences because 4.5 sounds like a lot until you have a child that's sick for a week and then there goes your eligibility for, for the entire quarter and I've been there several times and um, I had a couple of points oh also um, I, I don't think we can stress enough that ultimately attendance is on the parents more so than the students and there are a lot of reasons why students may not come to school. And it's not always because they don't want to come to school. There are a lot of factors. So I think that if we're looking at the whole child and what motivates that child, then we need to consider that whether they're farm students, whether they're special education students, there are a lot of different things that go into I'm here today, I'm present, you have no idea what it took for me to get to this place and now you're taking away the one thing that maybe I look forward to. You know? So I, d I don't wanna say that it, it should be a free for all and you, you, know, you have no attendance requirements, you have no GPA requirements. I know there are people that are gonna wanna go to that extreme. I'm, I'm not at that extreme, but I think that we shouldn't view these, these clubs, the honor society, you know, pep squad, band, football, whatever it is. I don't think we should view these as extracurricular in the sense that they're not necessary because for many they are absolutely necessary and I don't know if this is the point to raise this but another concern that's brought to me by a couple of, of parents in particular of students that may have special needs is that if you get that F and you retake the class but that F remains on your report card you can't ever really move past that you know so I want us to also consider if I retake the class remove the F if I then get a C or a B, allow me to move on from it because that's typically what will happen in college. It's not gonna always weigh you down so that you can never move up. So I, I want us to consider that as well. If we're truly trying to help our students be successful, then set them up for success and allow them every opportunity. And I appreciate what uh, Ms. S. Thomas mentioned about the NCAA uh, requirements because are we really doing our students a disservice in having a policy that's so strict that it's not even something that once they leave our doors that they necessarily need to consider like to whom does that benefit is what I would say you know so um, I had a few points a lot of them have been raised I, I'd like the idea of the required tutoring I understand why I may get some pushback but my response would be because you're looking to do something in addition to you're not just coming to school every day you're coming to school every day but you feel connected to you know the football team or the step team or whatever it may be and so as part of that as part of your way in as part of your you know yeah in the real world you you work hard you get a reward as part of your reward for going to tutoring if you are struggling is then you get to do this thing that you consider fun that that you want to excel at that maybe beyond this if you don't go to college when you leave here this becomes your your employable skills you know, so I think if we're trying to truly help all students succeed, this is this is huge. This is this is a very very big deal for me. Um, I believe. Oh, 
Oh, I think I touched on all of that. Um, I also wanted to talk about, um, and you know, probably don't have data on this, but something to consider as we propose this to the community, helping the community understand the correlation between the extracurricular activities and the incentive. And I think this is probably something that our student member can speak to very well. Is that truly an incentive for you? I suspect for many of them it is. You know, to be able to, to compete, to be able to perform. Because for many of them, candidly, school is just the means to the end. What I'm really passionate about is playing a sport or playing this instrument. And that's what's going to lead to my success in the future. This geometry class, I'm going to be candid. I can't remember a thing I learned in geometry. It was a means to an end. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was a means to an end. Now, I still had to get through it. Yeah, <laughs> you still have to get through it. So I'm not saying you don't have to, but just be candid. Many of the students, it's something they do it once and they may never use it again. So again, when we're looking at what does success look like for these students, I personally want to see every student succeeding at whatever level is best for him or her. It's not, or they, whatever their, their chosen pronouns may be, but it's not just this one standard, this one metric, because with 20-something thousand students, I don't even think that's realistic. But thank you all again. Carla Washington. Ms. Perkins. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Thomas, Ms. Kramer, and Ms. Morley kind of took half the words out of my mouth. Thank you. <laughs> um, my first question was, so let's say that like at the beginning of the first quarter, a student may have an F. If they bring that up in the middle of the quarter, would they be eligible to play or no? As it stands right now, no. Okay. So, and yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that wasn't what we had proposed today, but I did hear something similar to that, the whole um, conversation about re being able to redeem. I, I think that's what I heard um, yes, mentioned yeah. earlier. But, yes, but, but our yes. current policy, but, the answer is no. Correct. Okay. My second thing, Ms. Thomas had brought up a student opinion. I honestly do th th think that that is a good idea for those who are athletes or even just other clubs like SGA, Key Club, everything like that, and getting their input on what they think about it because – like she said, it impacts us. It affects us. Mm -hmm. Also, back to what Miss Creamer had said and Miss Morley about the motivation, and I have seen it personally. Like the students who play football, who play sports, who are really like into it, soccer, everything like that. That's what motivates them to get good grades. I've seen, even though like no offense to my school, but we suck at football. Personally, we we suck, but. I love our team because they were motivated. Every time they had a game, even though they knew they may lose or whatever, they were still motivated. They fought till the end. So they were passionate about it. And but not also the girls' just, soccer team. Yeah. yeah the girls' go. soccer team. Yeah. <laughs> they were passionate about it. Yeah. Also, this doesn't only affect athletes and the different clubs, but this also affects the managers that help out with those sports. Because what happens is all of these teams, at some point, they build a connection. So it's stronger than just the sport. It's stronger than just it's something to do. This is something that they're passionate about. They've built connections. So when they're not able to play, it affects them. And then also, like Ms. Morley brought up, it also affects their mental health too, which then that could also impact you academically. Because if I'm not right mentally, I'm not going to perform great academically. And then now it's just a lose-lose everywhere. Thanks. Ms. Barlow Washington. Yes, I, I got a little different spin on this. <clears throat> um, with all the numbers of the students that will be able to play reality, they will not all play on the team. The football can't take everybody. We know that. That's why you have to try out, cut, basketball, soccer, lacrosse, all of them do the same thing. I'm looking at this as a life lesson. When you get to a job, they're not gonna lower their standards to hire a daughter. They're not gonna do that. I'm gonna have to perform. And we want to be able to teach our children to, to perform in things that they want to do. And when you have sports, let's face it, sports is a, it's not a right. It is a condition for you to be able to play extra curriculum. So we have to spin this thing and tell our students that these are the things you want to do, we're rooting you on, we'll give you everything you need, but you gotta perform. You gotta bring the grade. You have to do it. It's not just for 
we understand that you don't. We're going to give you all the tools to make sure you succeed. We should not lower our standards. Because when I went to school, I, see, the school didn't tell me. Mother told me. You get an F. Matter of fact, you get below a, uh, in a C, you're not playing. That was my trigger. I wanted to be play basketball, majorette, and, and, and uh, soccer. Those are my three things. I knew I had to pass all year round because they're all different seasons. So that was my motivation because it got me out the house, got me with my friends and stuff. That was the motivation. So I don't want to set the standards to say if we give this benefit, but all the kids are not going to be able to get on all these teams. They're not. So are we really doing something? So if they don't play, we haven't even asked this, the, uh, the students, do you want to play sports? Suppose that the kids that we're talk that we doing this policy for, they don't even want to play sports. Well, that cannot sports. be their driver. It cannot be their driver. The driver is, I want to do it, and I am going to put in the work to do it because the school is going to give me the, the tools to do it. So that's my <laughs> access on this because when you talk about grades, if you look at this chart you put up, the one where all the schools, what they've done. If you want to be realistic, Prince George County has all the athletes, NBA, everywhere. They don't have a failing grade. They don't have a attendance. They got a 2.0. I'm just telling you where the people are coming from, from NBA, and we know these people. They did not lower their standards. They said 2.0. If you don't do the rest, you're not going. I don't care how good you are. So... You know, that's my selling point on making sure that we stay above the stray because we are the adults in here. We understand that our children want to do these things. We understand if, uh, if you fail a grade, it's consequences. If I don't pay my car note, it's consequences. It's always a consequence. So we cannot make it a situation where a child can get out of something because they're going to build on that. And when they get to the real world, it's going to be the same thing. So, but this real world is going to tell them, no, the school trick you. <laughs> it don't work like that in the real world. We want to prepare them for the world, not for a moment. They're going to go, they're gonna, we want them to strive to be the best that they're going to be. Mm -hmm. I'm going to leave it like that. Yes, yeah, so I, I don't think it's my role to, 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 to agree or disagree. We were sharing the information. <laughs> <laughs> much received your opinion just as we did everyone else's. I, I do, if I may, just want to do a clarification, um, Ms. Butler Washington, if we can put that chart back up just to clarify. Um, this one? No, 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 the, uh, all the school systems. So um, you mentioned Prince George's County. So Prince George's County's requirement right now is a 2.0 GPA, regardless of how many Fs you have. Attendance is not, so, so you could have, you could have you could have two failing grades in Prince George's, but as long as you have a 2.0 GPA, you can play. That's all they require. It's the uh, opposite. It's I apologize. The opposite. Yes. Okay. Okay. So the ones, the Charles County has a GPA requirement. It's got no failing grades, and it has that attendance requirement, which puts it at the very top because nobody else has an attendance requirement and, and no failing grades, except Carroll County has a 2.0 GPA and no failing grades, and so that's, that's, and that's how it goes. So okay. the, the ones in the green, they can have up to one failing grade. And you know, we often see this, this is because it's by quarters, you often see a kid who gets an F a quarter and then brings it back up and goes down. You know, you have that deviation, and so that's why a lot of counties, um, some of the, the counties in green said, well, we don't want to do more than just one. You better just have one where you had, you know, you don't like your um, Spanish teacher or you can't, you can't do Spanish for like one marking, but you better bring it up. And that's kind of how the greens kind of fall. And then everybody underneath that doesn't even, um, like the ones in the blue don't even discuss the failing grades. And then you see like Hartford County doesn't even put a GPA. It just says as long as you don't have any failing grades. So it's interesting the way these boards think about this, right? Everybody, we all have to have a standard. 
The question is, what's the right standard? And that is the discussion that you all have to have about what, what does that mean? So I just wanted to clarify that. Sure. And Ms. Perkins, you have a comment? Yes, um, so I wanted to go back to the tutor requirement thing. I do think that that could be something that is beneficial because if the sport or the club is something that you want to do when you have that failing grade, well, okay, we're giving you, like Ms. Um, Washington said, we're giving you the tools to strive. We're giving you, okay, well, if you do this tutoring and you bring that grade up to a C or a B or whatever, then you're eligible to play. But also not just being required for sports, because I mean, if it's a class that you need to pass, you need to do something to pass it. You can't just fail the class because then you're not going to pass. Um, so with grade recovery, if a student fails a class and they do grade recovery, would they be able, like, eligible to play after that? Not in the current policy. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that we brought up is is if you if you prove success, right. as Ms. Morley said, if you're in college and you would take a class, that old grade goes away, at least in most universities. From the so. way the grade recovery works anyway, though, they, they recover the grade from the previous quarter. Mm -hmm. And so they, you know, they, they got an F that quarter, so they weren't eligible that then, quarter and in most cases we're in a different season yeah, around season. the time that our that our quarters change and so that so they wouldn't be eligible right okay. now the way it works yes okay that makes sense okay yeah miss warren a lot of things going on after hearing everybody yeah. <laughs> talking and the teacher and me is crying out and the, this and that you know but um one of the things i was going to ask is this might sound like a crazy question but um, the origin, like, I guess, why is this conversation so important? Why is it so um, necessary to 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 make these changes, um, you know, to the policy? Was there some data that, you know, like the like, or, or a bunch of kids knocking down the door? Please do that. You know, I just want to know what brought about that. And it was something else that I wanted to say that I really want to remember. Um, can't remember at the moment but yeah. let's start there maybe it'll come back to me so i'm gonna i'll tell you who was responsible this person to my my oh, left yeah, here okay. so okay. <laughs> she'll speak to it okay. you know i'm just kidding you so um i, I know you want to respond to yeah, that so Dr. you know it's it's an interesting like i said to you this is a discussion and i had it with the previous board and i think you know if you go back you see how much they struggled and and the data they had to go through to figure out what makes sense for for this county um but um I look at policies in a way in which we just had this question around the policies and the impact that they have for students. Do we have policies that, o that open access and opportunity? Um, the eligibility, there's a question on, is this, um, as I, and I quote a former board member, you know, who was, who was very um, clear on their view around the eligibility policy. This is, um, this is a reward as um, for you to participate in extracurricular activities as a result of, of you being a strong student, sort of similar to Ms. Butler Washington's comment. And there is an, a, a spectrum throughout around, is it a carrot or is it, you know, is, is this an, an incentive to get kids to do really well? You've heard from your fellow board members on different perspectives, whether they're their own children's perspective or, other, or what they've heard. Um, and I think it, it reaches throughout the gamut. Um, my question on, on um, bringing the eligibility and frankly next the grading policy is that I really want this board to struggle with major policies that have impact on students when we talk about access and opportunities and accountability. And I, I, I take Mr. Hancock's questions and I wrote down his follow-up questions. Um, importantly so because if we offer access and opportunity, is it a, a strong um, return on the investment, do students, because they have access to participate more in key club or model UN um, or football, do they indeed do better as students? And I think we can probably run some interesting reports. I know I, I told the board how many more students were eligible as a result of their first change to the policy. But I think I'm gonna go back, and, and Steve may be listening to this, but I, and I will pull those students and see what their current GPA looks like, what was it looking like before. GPAs are cumulative, so it's harder and harder to, you know, if you, don't, if you mess up 
allot your first two years to get your GPA back up to a certain level. It's harder, it's cumulative. Um, and um, students who get access to Key Club and Mock UN and everything, Model UN, they put it on their resumes. And so obviously it's, you know, we, there's a question on, on who gets access then to put something that they did that was meaningful in school, um, what opportunities did they have? So this is why there's gonna be several policies that I bring forward that I ask the board, is this the policy that you wanna see for this point in time? And more importantly, what does that mean in terms of when I run the numbers for access and opportunity, like, I, like we did today, what does that mean? And okay. that's why uh, eligibility is one. Wait till we get to grading. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. <laughs> Lots spicy. of questions. Oh, it's going to be spicy, <laughs> spicy. So I did write down my question. Um, so speaking of access and opportunity, it was so many great points made. Uh, Hancock about the data to see what, you know, what has changed since we raised or lowered the um, GPA or, yeah, the GPA. Yeah. Um, speaking of, and then, uh, Brother Washington, about you know preparing kids for the future and not just for a moment. Um, when you're talking about opportunity, my question, one of my questions is, will this impact? How does this? This is a lot. But w what's the relationship um, between this 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 2.0 and all of these things that we're they're asking to change, and a student's ability to um, be eligible for the apprenticeships and things like that, the CTE, and does one have, you know what I'm saying? Yep. So those have nothing to do, um, so actually. Will they be eligible? So apprenticeship, um, do, we don't have an eligibility requirement on apprenticeships. Sure. Um, but we do have a GPA requirement for other things. We have a GPA requirement right now, from your, what you heard this morning at the legislative breakfast on dual enrollment in um, okay. early college. The the GPA requirement is a, what's the, what is it? 2.75. 2.75 is the, is the GPA requirement. So there are, there are requirements mm -hmm. in academic programming to do certain academic programs, yes. Okay, and I, you know, I just, I just feel like the push for this, and I can appreciate you looking at the policy and, um, you know, because everything starts with policy. Um, but just to push for it, it'd be nice to see this across all curricular areas to the point of, oh, you know, we just need tutoring for, well, you, you all didn't say this, but um, having tutoring for those that may be failing who want to play sports, but not only just for those folks, but having it for people who don't play sports. You know, like the push for those kinds of things to, um, you know, raise academic, Achievement, kind yeah, of. And, and principals are getting um, very creative with their tutoring opportunities because they're doing it during the school day, so that kids can't have excuses not to do tutoring. So, right now, um, if we had principals here, they would talk about the different ways in which they're incorporating mandatory tutoring for certain things during the school day, uh, because students are not doing very well. So sometimes that may involve if they're doing uh, extended lunches or if they're doing sort of cycles of doing that. So we haven't just, just because we're discussing it at this level, we haven't done a, a, a mandate system-wide, but um, we have absolutely been pushing for principals to find ways to get those kids in front of tutors. Um, either before or after school, but also during the school days. And a lot of schools have started using it during the school days, so you don't have an excuse of, I didn't have the computer at home or something like that um, for that support. We just haven't said it is a requirement that you do specific tutoring. And just for the record, I, you know, I was an athlete. I ran track in high school and middle school. I um, played tennis for five minutes in college. So I think... <laughs> Um, you know, I was a part of some extracurricular activities too in college, but I think for me, and I'm not saying, like I know we have very bright, um, creative students. So I'm, I'm you know, it's, this is gonna be an interesting um, conversation, um, but I don't want to um, make our students weak in a sense. And, um, you know, not ready for the world. And I'm not saying, that this will make them weak, but I just, 
there has to be a standard, and we did a good. We have done a good job of keeping a standard, and um, whatever whatever the outcome is, um, I just want to say that it's not uh, failure happens, but it's not okay in the sense of you know not caring about your grades. So that's for the students, um, or just wanting to show up. Every every class counts. <laughs> Every class, TV class, every, because you can glean from, I think more Lee talked about the skills, you know, um, from um, the class or the course. So that's, that's the main thing that, that I want students to know, that every class counts, every class is important, there's something to be learned in every class, so. Yeah, so Ms. Thomas. I, I guess one of the points that I would like us to remember, because I think the tutoring component is really important, I think, um, that was raised, um, whenever you're participating in extracurricular activity, you think about the time that they put into that. So I just challenge each one of you to get up in the morning and do your whole job, pay attention, go spend two, three hours of rigorous physical activity, and then go home and do two hours of homework. And then do your activities on the weekends and then do the again. Because many of us would not be able to do that and we're asking students, so it's the balance. And I only say that because it teaches a lot of the things that um, Ms. Warren just raised, also Ms. Ms. Butler Washington raised. We are teaching them something. Activities build community. And community builds inclusiveness and belongingness. And that's what we really want in our school district, right? Um, in addition to that, when people are recruiting and you put things like I was at Model UN and these things on your resume, um, there are corporations that go specifically to um, recruit athletes to be their corporate leaders because it builds leadership skills, being able to follow instructions and direction and be a team builder. So I really think that we just have to innovatively think about the way, because I, the current policy, I think, if I, and if I'm wrong, it's on the record, it says it's a privilege to be in extracurricular activities. I arduously disagree. It's not a privilege. It's part of our community, and it's what we're building. And I think we need to look at the policy the same way, which is why our first community that we go talk to is the students. It's their community. A couple, Ms. Perkins. So we got to wrap up because we are woefully behind. Um, I just wanted to go back to what Ms. I mean, Dr. Navarro was saying about the tutoring inside of school. So I don't know for any other school, but I know from my school, what we started doing was a 30 minute extension period for each class. So every day it switches or whatever. It starts with Monday, it starts with first period and we have 30 minutes extended. So in that 30 minutes, we can get extra help. We can go to um, our teachers and ask them like, okay, I'm struggling with this or even just making up work. So we can't say, oh, well, I didn't have time to do this or I couldn't do this at home or I had something to do. So you can't make that excuse. And then I had a question. So what if a student is failing or like they don't have a necessarily like a passing grade, but they're trying, like they're putting in the work, they're trying, they're doing the work, but it's just something that they're not getting. As it stands right now, if it's an F, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. not them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, a couple of things. Um, the attendance part. So, it's four and a half days. So, for the board's um, knowledge, that, that was a completely arbitrary number. That's 10% of a quarter, right? It's 45 days and a quarter and it's 10% of a quarter. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know where that number came from, that, that's where it came from. Really tough to track in Synergy too, by the way. The yeah. 4.5, yeah, yeah. yeah. yes it is. Really I tough. think, it, but that's, <laughs> that, that's where it came from. So there was discussion about, you know, perhaps broadening that. Honestly, I, I don't, for 99% for of the kids, I don't know why they have an unexcused absence. You don't need a note from a doctor anymore. If you're sick, you're sick. Your parent says you're sick. You're good. I mean, so I, it, it, it boggles me that there's so many unexcused absences because we we took care of a lot of that a few years ago. We revised the note. policy so that it was very easy, yeah. even to do after the fact. It was so the fact that we have those unexcused absences now is still makes my head scratch. Um, so the farms. Numbers, and I don't know if you presented that to us before. 
I don't think he did because that really jumped out at me. Ms. Creamer mentioned it. So that's that's half. That's half the students. So half the students are farm students. It'd be beneficial, I think, if we had if we could get a breakout. You could send it weekly updates. Um, I think this should be easy by school, by high school. These by, numbers by high school, by high school. For, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We won't. Yeah. Um, because that's. That that honestly that that number surprised me that it was it was that high that that literally is half right I mean it's 1,100 students and it's it's 550 and 540 respectively that you show in the farm stuff so so half of the people that would become eligible if you if you adopted the proposed changes would come from the farms population if I'm reading all this correctly yeah. So if we had that by high school, I think that would be good because to, to the conversation about, you know, tutoring and, and extra support for the student, I mean, if we find that it's focused in one or two schools, then, then perhaps the answer is to focus on those one or two schools, right? And in addition to possibly doing some other changes. And also, if is, is it possible to get, um, and this may be a little bit of uh, too much of an ask, what classes um, the students when they have F's, what classes those are? And maybe they're, they're too far spread out to make any statistical difference, but, but maybe there's a common theme there that there's classes. So, I appreciate the discussion. It's good. And, and you know, to Ms. Smeech Thomas's point, right? It's, it's, you know, certainly it's fair to say education is different than it was 40 and 50 years ago, and and you you're about providing as much opportunity for kids as possible. Um, admittedly, though, if 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 any standard's lower, there's less of an impetus to to if you're if you want to participate to do better, at least for the purposes of participating in that extracurricular activity. But to everyone else's comments, it does help you get more engaged in the whole school culture, and that's what we're trying to do from, from a holistic level. And, and we can talk about data all you want. I think it, it's real hard, even with the changes that were proposed, right? So those, those cohorts of kids are gone from the school system now. So now you have a new cohort coming as, as they matriculate through the grades. and. Um, <coughs> You know how many of those kids are actually even going to participate? You, you have no way of knowing that, and 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 you're doing the best you can with the data. But um, if we can get those two things, I think that'd be helpful for all of us going forward. So echo everyone's comments. Very good presentation. Lots and lots of good data. Are, are we good forging on, or do we need a break? Break. break. Okay, I have break. Okay, so let's take uh, ten minutes and then come back. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Miss Acton. And my friends. And, and friends. And friends. <laughs> Miss Acton and friends. Miss Miller, Miss Fisher Davis. Yes. No telling what you might ask. I need, I need all my friends. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Good evening, ladies. Hello. Hello. Nice to see you again today. All right. All right. Um, so, uh, Board Chair Lucas, Vice Chair Morley, Board Members, Dr. Navarro, staff and stakeholders, I'd like to introduce Miss um, Karen Acton, Chief Financial Officer, Sherry Fisher Davis, Budget Manager, and I am Chris Miller, your Blueprint Implementation Coordinator. And we are here to talk to you about the implications of the budget when it comes to the Blueprint. We talked a little bit about this this morning. Um, as Dr. Navarro, her term, we gave you a little appetizer uh, to talk about the 7525 funding. Um, I think this is going to be a continued discussion. This is not going to be um, something that we just glance over. Um, but we wanted to bring it to you early so we can start thinking um, with a different lens when we're talking about the budget. Uh, so we're going to look at what the law is. We're going to look at how we currently report on um, our budget. 
We're going to look at what uh, the blueprint is requiring us to do when it comes to reporting. We're going to look at the potential impact of change. You know, we like to look at our crystal ball and think about, uh, anticipate some things that, uh, some implications that we may have. And then we're going to look at two very um, similar schools. And by similarities, I mean that they are similar in the number of students that they serve, just so we can see a potential example when it comes to this. So according to the blueprint, um, each district, we have to be able to show that each school was budgeted and utilized 75% of the total blueprint funding. So that's defined by um, minimum school funding is 75% of the per pupil amount. And as Karen told us earlier today, that is both the state and the local um, blueprint funds for that. For each school, the county board, we will distribute the minimum school funding amount for the applicable program multiplied by the school enrollment. And that is beginning for July 1, 2024. So for fiscal year 25 and each July 1st thereafter, the county board shall report on the county board's compliance with this section. And as you know, we report on um, how we spend our money. There's lots of blueprint reports that are due throughout the school year. And we do post this information on our uh, blueprint web page. So these are the prescriptive formulas that um, determine the amount of funding that each LEA uh, will receive for each of the student groups. So we look at the basic foundation funding, we look at compensatory uh, education, English language learners, special education, pre-kindergarten, uh, pre transitional supplemental instruction, college and career readiness, the comparable wage index, and concentration of poverty. So as we go through this presentation, and Karen gets into more detail with this, keep in mind that not all of our schools here in Charles County will receive funding in each of these categories. We only have, right now, five uh, community schools. So that's where we get our concentration of poverty. Um, transitional supplemental instruction is only for uh, K through school, K through three schools um, for uh, students that are struggling. So as we go through this presentation, keep that in mind that not every school is going to receive funding in each of these categories. Okay, so I'm going to start with the current funding allocation process that we have right now, um, which is that NSDE sends funds to the LEA based on the wealth equalized formulas, and many of these are wealth equalized. And the county funding is driven by maintenance of effort. We create a budget based on those categories. We send small discretionary allotments to the schools, and we, we report back to NSDE by the um, expenses for those state categories, but we're doing it in total for the, for the school system. Expenditures currently are centralized for the most part. Um, some things have been allocated out to the schools, but that hasn't been our general process, including utilities, main, um, materials of instruction, salaries, and other bulk spending. So that's kind of at the crux of this change is that we have to change how we do business and how we allocate expenditures. So on the next slide, we're gonna talk about what the blueprint funding allocation process is. So MSDE will send funds to us based on wealth equalized formulas, but it's all also based on these um, categories in the blueprint. For instance, basic foundation is, is on total enrollment by school Compensatory education is on farms numbers per school. English learners is based on those number of students within each school. Special ed pre-K is kind of self-explanatory. TSI, as Chris mentioned, is struggling learners um, in K through three. College and career ready readiness are those that have achieved um, by school by 10th grade for AP and CTE. Comparable wage index is a regional um, difference that is given to um, different 
different LEAs based on the cost to produce to provide those services in that regional area. Um, and then you have concentration of poverty, which is the community schools, which is based on 60% farms. So in this situation here, now that we're going to, we have to budget this way, but we also have to allocate our expenditures this way. Um, the county must match the local share for blueprint. If MOE exceeds that local share, then they give us MOE. So it, it depends on, on how it works. Right now, they give us MOE. But the formulas for blueprint change every year based on how much the state is giving and how much the county has to give. So those numbers will continue to um, change. So the reporting requirement currently is that we have to report on all of these categories for each individual school in Charles County, not even in total by the school, but each of these categories. And that's a little bit of a challenge. Yes. Mm -hmm. May I interject uh, sure. for a second? So um, I just want to contextualize this a little bit. Let's take the English Learner Fund. Um, so part of the blueprint is an additional funding um, tied to English learners. And the way we do our work currently, as Karen was talking about this, is that we will get that pot of, fund of funding, um, let's say we had 100 English learners in the school system, and centrally we would take those funds and we would use all of those fundings for the 100 students and we would figure centrally the allocations of how many um, ESOL teachers we need at each school site and make that all centrally. Mm -hmm. This is a shift where every student has an amount of funding and so just think about an English language learner. That amount of funding has to follow the student to that school site. So before schools are not really focusing on, you know, uh, how much um, ESOL services they get, the central office sort of calculates about how many English uh, language learners you have in your school and this is about the allocation of a teacher FTE full-time equivalent that you're going to get. Now it's just the funding follows the student, the school doesn't necessarily know what the teacher's specific salary is or any of those logistics, but now the, the, the funding when it gets to the student and it follows the student to the schoolhouse, it gen then generates a budget at the schoolhouse. So instead of the central office managing and sort of dealing with all of the funding, really it's each school having a set of funding depending on the students that it serves. And in the blueprint law, it has specific uh, supports for specific um, subgroups of students, right? And or subgroups of conditions of communities, like the community school piece. So that's an interesting piece um, to talk about. And I just wanted to remind you the college and career blueprint dollars, as I mentioned this morning, um, the State Board of Education is discussing in its meeting uh, next week, right? December 5th, or can't remember, um, but it's next Tuesday. What that CCR, the College and Career Readiness metric will be. When it sets that, that then it ties to the blueprint law about which students uh, we will get funding for at our high schools uh, for that CCR um, metric. So that's an important piece. I just wanted to, to tie all those pieces together because I will be sending the board the link to the board to the state board meeting so you final so that we know what is the decision on that because it'll have funding implications even as we project out um moving forward for our budget so sorry just wanted okay. to add that. all right um so the potential impact of change um as we've talked about the blueprint funding is going to vary based on the demographics of the students in each school Resource allocation will need to be distributed based on the funding and the needs of each school, which is different than what we've necessarily been doing. And expenditures for each school and program must be reported to MSDE. And then the potential um, school comparison. We have two schools up on the screen for you. School A, they, they both have similar enrollment, although school A has about 25 more students than school B, but that's very close. 
But you can see if you go to the bottom, even though School A has 25 more students, they have about $1.1 million less based on the demographics of that school. And highlighted for you <clears throat> are the areas where it's impacted. Compensatory education is much lower in School A than in School B. Um, you also have concentration of poverty money. As Chris said in the beginning, not all of that funding will be allocated to each school. So School B has com concentration of poverty. The English learner funding is much different in the two schools. Um, uh, special ed is, and so is pre-K. So in School A, we've, we had basically low farms numbers, low ESOL, medium pre-K, and low special ed. School B had high farms, medium ESOL, high pre-K, and medium special ed. So that kind of shows you um, in a picture of the challenges that we might have um, and the decisions we might need to make based on the funding that will come down for each school. Can I also just add for context, um, if you recall, 80 to 85 percent, I take um, nurses yeah, take contracted and, services. and contracted services for bus drivers in. When we take a look at um, nursing and transportation, 85 percent of our budget is tied to salaries. So once we pay salaries and benefits, so 85% of our, of our overall budget is tied to that, and I think that's an important piece as we look at the funding following the student. What does that mean as well? So um, we don't have all the answers right now because um, we are not required to budget this way until the next fiscal year, which is the budget that Sherry is working diligently on. Um, and we have started trying to report our expenses by school, but that's a new process because we have not allocated all of those expenses out. Um, so if we, once we've done that process, you set, this is showing you the 75% minimum. So there, are, there is additional funding, that additional 25% that could go to certain schools. There also is, um, you know, the overage that the, that the county gives us beyond the blueprint that could go to these schools. But you also have central that is that has to be funded. So that's, that's the big challenge. And you have different, you know, tenured teachers and what, and administrators and different schools that will have to play into that analysis. Are there questions? <laughs> I, so before we start questions, can I just sort of mention also, so we want to we want to talk about this today. Um, we want to hear some of the questions and comments from the board, but we intend to come back to the board with the budget um, at the budget discussion, but later on also around what is the way we look at utilizing this requirement in the blueprint in a blueprint as it was intended, which is to create innovative ways of looking at schooling and innovative ways of supporting the students with the greatest need. And so that's an important piece I think you'll hear from us. We want to kind of get a sense from, from this board of how they're interpreting and what questions they have, and then we want to come back uh, later and talk about what does that mean for our school systems as we take a look at where the funding eventually falls once we do this this budget breakdown um, and you can see more concretely across all of our schools this is what it looks like and one other item that i failed to mention is that pazam is going to present legislation um, instead of us having to report by each of the blueprint categories for each school that um, we change the, the requirements so that it is the total dollars that go to each school that we have to report it that way, which allows a little more flexibility within the schools. Um, but that hasn't passed yet, obviously, because we're sure. just presenting it. <laughs> so I have a question. Let's suppose, let's suppose this year we are budgeted by the state under the blueprint $100 million, just to, to make it easy to think about. The superintendent 
allocates that money as a superintendent sees fit, and it's going to be based largely on on st just student population at schools, and she'll ultimately staff to that. So next year is the, is the formula for the blueprint different, or would we get all things being equal? Would we, would we get that same hundred million? but it'll be more prescriptive. It'll be broken out by school. That's correct. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so my question is then if I'm, and we have the commissioners with us this morning, if I'm a commissioner, <laughs> do I worry about that from, from the fact that there are resource sponsors? Cause when I looked at this, it didn't sound like from a local level, they would have to potentially come up with more funding it's just that the the funding would be more accountable on a school level and, and again unless i'm missing something i didn't know if the formula was different and somehow now because of these areas no. okay so it really is just so we'll have the total amount of money that yep. we would have had this year yeah you know based on enrollment but got it it's, it's okay so we Perfect. talked about it earlier and dr navarro brought it up you know, it's that conversation that we need to have about equity versus equality. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, equality is giving everybody a shoe. Equity is giving everybody a shoe that fits. And so this budget is really fitting the needs of the schools. Sure, sure. No, that, I understand that. I just wanted to make sure that there was no mm -hmm. potential greater financial impact on, on, on a local level. Other than what uh, already exists. Right. Other, other, yeah, other than yeah. that, yeah, not so insignificant <laughs> yes. fact. That, yes. But, uh, but I, I will say, from a blueprint perspective, Charles County was in a much better place yes. than the majority of the state. Yeah. But a budget is more than the blueprint. So when other things rear their ugly head, then we have to, to make tough decisions. But I'll stop now. Uh, Ms. Smith and then um, Ms. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lucas, and I think my question is probably in the same vein as yours, which is I'm trying to understand if this is more so informational and in that this is coming down the pike and this is going to look different than what we've done in years past, or if there is some underlying concern or issue you'd like for us to be aware of as we begin moving toward this new kind of structured budget. So uh. I'll get it started. <laughs> <laughs> So the way, since most of our funding is tied to salaries, and the way it works is that a more experienced teacher is more costly than others. Mm -hmm. We have schools, and our, and, and our Title I schools and our high poverty schools tend to have newer teachers. So there is something to be um, said about thinking about where our more experienced teachers usually are um, teaching. Mm -hmm. And, um, and while we, and we did this exercise actually last year with Nikki and we went to the union to EAC, EACC and I have to say EACC is sitting here shoulder to shoulder with us trying to figure out the implications of what that is. So not only do we have a wonderful um, support at the, at the, um, from the county commissioners in terms of, of funding, but we are also not in an adversarial situation with our union, which is really helpful to try to figure out these very complex systems. Um, when we did last year a distribution of where are all our tenure teachers are, are that have been here the longest, because one of our interests was to not have um, any school that had a high percentage of new teachers we wanted to have a mixture of teachers who were in their first three years and then in their first 10 years and then 15 years and 20 plus years. Um, we do have, as it is true in, in, in many places, some schools that have um, higher, that have higher numbers of students impacted by poverty, for example, who tend to have larger percentage of brand new teachers. And so what we wanna sort of queue up is that we are thinking about this work that the blueprint puts out there um, in a way that allows us to think um, of a school like School B that clearly has a higher concentration of needs, um, to be thinking about it in a way that we can have a teaching and learning environment that can be innovative 
and will attract and retain a lot of tenure teachers. It doesn't have to be all tenure teachers, but it won't be a school that, that constantly has a lot of brand new teachers teaching in it. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how do we do that um, is something that we're just starting to come together with. We're gonna start a work group, um, including EACC, to start thinking about what, how we could do this work. That's really the reform work that the blueprint is calling for. Um, and meet the requirement of the law that says, you know, school, these schools need to be funded at this level. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to sort of make some tough decisions because we also don't want to negatively impact um, other areas of our county as well. And therein lies the complexity of thinking about how do we do that innovation at the same time that we keep um, certain standards throughout all of our schools. And, and just to, to also say that if we don't show the proper use of the, that funding, that 75% minimum, then future funding is withheld from us. There's a penalty. So we have to figure this out. We have to make sure that we're utilizing the funds in, in each particular school the way it's intended. And just a brief follow-up, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Sure. What is the timeline for ensuring that we get it right? Like recognizing, I'm hearing you all say that we're not reporting the um, financials in this way currently, but we're moving toward it. What's July the 1, July, July so 1? July 1, 24. However, we have in uh, a different format, have we been required to report school level spending. Mm -hmm. So at least for the past, you know, three or four years, we've had to submit a report to MSDE that shows how much is spent at each school level, how much is at the um, central office level. So we, we been building up to this point, but 7124 is the budget that needs to be 7525. So we've reported the expenditures, but we have not aligned it with the budget okay. that, that reflects this. So we don't yet know how far we off are off from that 7525 split? No. We did an analysis that showed there were some challenges, but it's not egregious. It's, no, not, it's it's significant it's enough that we need to talk about yes. it as a board and so this is the initial conversation we did some analysis um, because we needed to push to put back some expenses at schools again we've mm -hmm. been central for a very long time and we are rerunning the numbers um, but regardless of how you run the numbers the fact that the blueprint requires 75 percent of the expenses to follow kids Frankly, in higher impacted schools, you're going to see more funding because that's the intent of the blueprint mm -hmm. than lower impacted schools in our county. And so we are gonna see um, deltas. And in this case, this is a pretty accurate, this is, this is, you know, we didn't name the schools, but this is a pretty accurate um, example of some of our biggest deltas. And so a million, uh, a, a million to two million differences in elementary schools or in schools of a certain size, 500 or whatever the number was, I can't remember, um, is significant. Um, if we estimate, I don't know, an average teacher salary, and that's an average teacher salary, Sherry gets, tells me to calculate it at 107,000. <laughs> so, with um, benefits. With benefits, benefits 107,000 with benefits. In some of our schools, if we were to calculate that, um, average teacher salary in one school, it, it may be 120000 and then you go to another school, and the average salary in another school may be 78000 So the deltas are there, um, and, um, and it's interesting around how do we make innovative changes mm -hmm. that our staff can get behind. That's the most important thing. How do we get innovative changes and opportunities that our staff can get behind and support? So oh, appreciate the precursor. Looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Um, I'm all about the numbers, so this is good to see the numbers and the modeling. I think um, one of the things that you you know, Dr. Navarro, you said is that if 85% of the the funding or, or the the expenditures are salary and benefits. If you pull that out and you do the model based on taking that out, because you talked about that, and you just look at the non-salary and benefits 
funding that's left at the schools. So if you take the teacher salaries out, if you've done a model that way that kind of tells you now what do you, what do you what do you left to then allocate across the schools? Because it's kind of I'm thinking it's a balance for you, right? You have a lot of autonomy now to kind of shuffle things as you need to, and you kind of lose that. But if you go back to the blueprint and say for us the salary is a is a huge piece. Yeah. How do we balance with, with taking salary out, redacting that So price? I would say that in order to balance the difference between these two schools of a million dollars, you can't do it without doing salaries. So you got to take some of, I, and I would look to Sherry. Sherry is my sort of guru on this. But I, you, you're going to have to, there's going to be implications on maybe getting more um, related services, funding for counseling or anything like that. But really to make a million or plus uh, changes, you're taking... Um, people whose salaries are higher, more tenure folks, and moving them to the schools where um, there's the bigger sort of need. And that is not the natural distribution in public education. Right. Um, and so I think the other thing we need to think about is when you're not talking just about salaries, what other things will people go to certain schools to work for? Mm -hmm. And that's what the the core committee, including the union, um, and we're gonna get some feedback from our teachers and our administrators on this, what would that be? And so it calls for other things that are also called for in the blueprint that actually do will cost a lot more on the local side funding, mm -hmm. which could be an extended day mm -hmm. or a co-teaching model, right. right? Or it could be, you know, our career ladder with a teacher lead who models a classroom for part of the day and then, you know, supports uh, other teachers for part of the day. And so those things are more expensive to have and as a structure for a school, but maybe the levers that attract very tenure, more expensive teachers to those schools. Uh, the superintendent has right now uh, across the state the ability to move staff as needed mm -hmm. but I would say that what we want to do is incentivize and inspire our our um, our teachers and our best teachers to be at some of the um, schools that where uh, there's a concentration of higher numbers of students that need a lot of support Okay, yeah, because, you know, when you talk about that, that dollar amount, when I said take the salaries out, to me it wasn't take the salary out to distribute what else is left, but take the salary out and say now that we have this and we know, I think Ms. Majors would have a, a, a lot of thoughts about, like, what do you do to incentivize teachers to take yeah. the more difficult, because the, at the end of the day, the mission is to educate children, but you can't do that without teachers, and, you know, you want to have them in the right place based on the way the, the blueprint is distributing. Uh, those salaries and I think it's intended to I mean in, in a lot of counties you have like wealthier counties who have a higher income then they get more money and some of the ones that have less income socioeconomically historically have gotten less money so I think they're trying to balance and for us to keep the or preserve the intent of that while still making sure that we're getting the need and that's just we, you got to think about how you move people mm -hmm. but not voluntold <laughs> um, but you know a way that they want to do it mm -hmm. Yeah, Ms. Creamer. Thank you all for this presentation. I think the chart was most helpful for me, the comparison, because that really sort of illustrates for me what you meant. And so the first thing I wrote down was my question, which is what Ms. Smith got to, um, was that will this mean that higher paid or more tenured teachers are going to move sort of towards those higher need schools? And it sounds like that is exactly what the design is. Um, and under the blueprint, that makes sense. Um, I just think, and I know you touched on this a little bit, Dr. Navarro, I think the main um, point, again, as with so many things, is messaging to our teachers. So I'm glad to hear that we're working with EACC because I think they're gonna be instrumental in that. Um, but you know, if we can just break it down and explain the why, and then also look at ways that we can incentivize, um, I feel like you know, our teachers that are tenured teachers and who have that experience and, and are truly dedicated to their their craft are going to, I think we're gonna be able to get them to buy in. Um, it's not like we're asking them to take like a cut in salary, you know, um, we're just saying, hey, we need you more um, in these other spaces and here's some things that we're gonna do to sort of help um, 
you know, incentivize you to, to do that. So um, appreciate this presentation. And like I said, the, the chart was really illustrative. So that was great. Thanks. Mr. Hancock. Thank you, Chairman. Real quick, um, thank you for the update. And it is very important. And it's actually really, you know, cool to see it on paper to help it all make sense. Mm -hmm. And um, just I want to offer <clears throat> my support to the superintendent in her approach <coughs> to um, trying to attract tenured teachers to where, where they are needed. Um, you know, when you're, you're a tenured teacher that has been around a while, you often get that luxury that comes with seniority to where you can go where you want to go and do what you want to do. Um, but you don't want to force any staff member to do anything because then you run the risk of losing that val very valuable instructor from any school. Um, so I like, I like the approach of um, thinking about incentives. And um, I would dare say, I know you can, we can't talk contracts or anything like that, but I would dare say, you know, working with the union to see if they would be open to any kind of compensation that we that we could work on, you know, because at the end of the day, money talks when you've been around a while and you're going to ask me to go to a place I don't want to go. You know, there's a price for everything. And, um, you know, it's and it is I agree with Ms. Kramer and some others that working with the EACC and in the messaging and, and being out front. Look, we're not trying to force anyone to do anything, but the law is going to require us to do something. How can we work together to to make sure that everyone is happy in how we move forward. So great presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you. And keep in mind too, I mean the research is clear too about retaining teachers. It's not all about the money. Sure. It's not yeah. so we need to think uh, you know, creatively and and really have the voice of the teachers as well. We need to have their input about why do you stay at a school? What are the reasons behind it? And remember, we do have the career ladder that we have to implement as well. So that goes hand in hand with this to see how we can implement these innovative ideas you know, uh, to get our teachers to stay in these schools where our students need it the most. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Ms. Uh, Butler Washington. Yes, so thank you for this presentation. Uh, it is great. Um, it is a true equity mm. plan. Mm. The reason I say that because all students will be successful and by putting the seasoned teachers in the schools where our students need them the most, that can only be the best for everybody. And so when you, when you do things like that, and I'm saying a seasoned teaching teacher will see the benefit because they're the benefit. They're the one who's doing this. They're put first, they're put out there to help a child. And that's truly what a, I'm thinking what a teacher heart is. They just wanna make sure that every child succeeds and they wanna do it in the best way they can do it. So by creating uh, the blueprint, creating this for us, uh, it really put it back to where it was before back when I went to school, because that's what the teachers uh, foremost was. It was making sure that everybody succeed and they had a, a, you had a plan in it. Mm -hmm. And so that was enough for them. And I do understand, um, Mr. Hancock, when you say money talks, um, but I truly think a teacher is a different breed because money do talk, but them putting their effort, their skill into building a child that they know once was broken, and now they have built them to give them the skills they have, and they go out and flourish into life, that's a bigger picture for them. And that's a bigger picture for anybody, because I beg the difference, even for me, if you um, say I go out and do something, if it's my true passion, money can't outdo my passion, because I did what I love to do. And that builds me and it builds everything about me and it says who I am. So I think and I'm giving the uh, teachers kudos because I know they will uh, come together and they will bind together and they will do what their truly hearts are meant to do. So this is a great uh, way of making sure that equity is across the line for everybody. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Marlene. Just one quick comment and thank you, um, as my colleagues have said for this presentation, I always enjoy these. You know, I'm very partial to you, Ms. Miller, because <laughs> I've, been, I've been loving your blueprint updates. But um, with that said, and, you know, respectfully, um, we do need to look at what I've, at least what I've heard so far, is the number one potential incentive for teachers is housing. I know Ms. Kramer has touched on it before in this, in this session. We've had a, a small discussion. I think 
if there were anything else, there, and I'm sure there are other things, but that's, that's what I've personally heard the most is, yes, it's, it's great to have a starting salary somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 something, $58,000, but when housing is a half million dollars, you know, how is, how is that sustainable and affordable? I know we have a lot of um, international teachers that, that we've been able to attract, which is fantastic, and I love the, the diversity and the culture, but should they, you know, I know they have to go back and then, you know, come again, can they afford to do that? You know, can we afford to attract teachers from other areas? Um, and can we, can we keep them? You know, if you can get them here with these higher starting salaries, but then can they live here? Is this sustainable? And I say this respectfully on behalf of District 4, which has both extremes. When we did the data walk, we unfortunately had one of the highest, if not the highest areas of uh, concentration of poverty. And we also have the highest <laughs> starting prices for houses. So we, you know what I mean? We, we see a little bit of both. So um, that is something that, um, and I know it's not, it's beyond just our scope here. So I, I understand that, but if, if there's something we can do, and, and it's wonderful to offer, you know, the degrees, um, you know, to be able to reimburse and all of that, but housing is something that will bankrupt many people, just being very <clears throat> candid with you. Housing and, and medical bills, and I know we're doing as much as we can on the medical end, but, uh, oh, bless you. Thank you. So that is, that is my two cents on that. Yeah. I, I mean, speaking as somebody who moved, you know, here, 20 plus. I mean, I know. I know you guys thought. Was, I mean, I know exactly. Um, but, you know, my husband, who is also an educator, um, you know, we struggled the first several years. Um, and, you know, it's not that we're not still struggling now because we have two kids and, man, they're expensive. But, um, you know, but, right, right, I'm going broke again. But, um, yeah, I know Dr. Navarro and I have talked about, you know, our wish to win the lottery and, you know, have, you know, teacher housing. Um, but certainly I think it's something that um, I think we all know that that is a, a, an issue here. And I would love to think of creative ways to solve that. Maybe I could rent my basement out and then solve my issue. <laughs> <laughs> my kids, <laughs> right, I know. It's like, um, but, yeah. Ms. Smith. No, just briefly, because I did speak on this issue already, but just wanting to note that retaining high quality teachers in some of our higher poverty schools, our Title I schools, is not just a challenge in Charles County, it's a challenge nationally for years, mm -hmm. for years, yeah. to the point where we've had some of our federal partners putting out mm -hmm. policy around how can you retain some high quality, and not just high quality, but seasoned teachers. Mm -hmm teachers who've been on the job for more than five years, more than three years, because we do typically see that our lower resource schools, not in terms of finances, but in terms of teacher tenure, typically are our higher poverty schools. Yeah. So it's not just a matter of what our educators are called to do, that this is not a profession, it's a passion, but we are seeing the trend that some of our, again, more seasoned mm -hmm. teachers are in, our, in other schools besides our higher poverty schools. So, and I know that there are pockets throughout the county, through, not the county, but throughout the country, that have found ways of being creative, of attracting some of those more seasoned teachers to some of those schools in which we're looking to increase the number of years of our educators at those schools. Mm -hmm. So I'm not quite sure what benchmarking can be done to figure out like what are those pockets of innovation and what can we bring here? But just noting that there are some people who are figuring it out, if we can learn from them and perhaps adopt it, that'd be great. We are, and, and the committee that um, Dr. Navarro was speaking about, um, you know, we have been looking at research around the nation, and remember, the blueprint was looking at the best schools in, in the world. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a diverse group of people with a diverse um, experiences, and um, we are looking at, at different, um, schools and what schools have done to not only bring teachers but to retain them as well um, and looking at what the research is is saying about um, teacher retention um, and again having that teacher voice is really going to be um, it, it's important because they're the ones with, with the boots on the ground and to some of my colleagues points it's not just if we pay them they will come or they will stay right. 
but perhaps it is additional days off for those teachers in some of our Title I schools, or it's perhaps more autonomy over the types of professional development that they have an opportunity to take at those particular schools. But it's being creative in that we're trying to incentivize them in coming and staying in these particular schools by offering them love the housing idea if our commissioners would support it um, and giving them something that they're able to, again, staples to keep them in those communities, in those schools, educating our children. Ms. Thomas. Um, thank you for that. And um, I wanted to ask, you said you have to um, change the way you allocate the money. Okay, and it goes, each school have to do their own allocation type to show the budget spending the correct way? We'll, we will set the budgets for them. We uh -huh. will allocate it. Um, they have to um, process any expenditures they have against the budget, but it's also in central office, for instance, if we <clears throat> order textbooks for third graders, we need to allocate that expense to all the schools based on the enrollment for third graders, which is a different um, way than what we've done before. Um, and this have to be done by, you said, uh, July the 1st, 2024? That's when the budget has to be set that way, and that's when we need, we'll need to start reporting. Okay, so you say you need to start by then or you haven't started already? So we have started already. Um, um, for example, with ordering, if we have um, like Dreambox is a software subscription that all elementary schools use. Typically that bill comes in and it's paid on a central office account code. We can't do that anymore. That bill has to now be split 22 ways because each elementary school takes advantage of that software system. So any and everything that comes in, if we can um, determine exactly where it's going to be, then we allocate it that way. So we're doing that on this side, but then on the back end, we have to then say, okay, Dreambox is split 22 ways. So when we're building the budget, the budget needs to be split at that level 22 times for however much the subscription costs. So we've, 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 we've got a pretty good handle on tracking the expenses at the school level. We've just got to now come behind it and match the budget to the expenses at that level. Okay, thank you. Ms. Thomas. Is there, is there a way to go back and, and talk to the blueprint, uh, uh, the, the thoughts that they had around the burden? You know, at the federal government level, they'll, they'll give you policy, you implement it, and then you get to go back and say, this is the burden <laughs> on us for doing this. And, and oftentimes that, you know, being able to just talk about the burden helps to be able to clarify some points, like splitting software between 22 schools is a little bit absurd, right? Because you, you're only, I mean, if you did that, it would cost you more money to have the licenses split than to buy them, because you get economies of scale. So when we say split it 22 we, ways, we're saying the bill comes in for right. 100,000. We just divide right. it and we have 22 account lines. But, but I guess my point is to build 22 account lines just to report when it's just not practical. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered if there was an opportunity after this you know, first go round for you all to go back and say, here's a couple points of clarity in, in, in theory it sounded great, but in practicality, here's a couple of refinements that you know we would like to have because some of these things aren't just practical. So I don't know, I, I guess I would like to see us collect that you know, post after doing this and saying here are a couple of points that even back up to the legislator we could talk about, like here's some things that need to be refined a bit. Can I ask a clarifying mm -hmm. question quickly? Are you referring to Ms. Uh, Ms. Thomas, the burden on staff? Is yes, you, okay. the burden on, yeah, the I, burden I, on I, staff I, I to, to do all this work yeah. um, just, to, just for, you know, something that just is not practical for some things. For some things, I very much think it's practical and we should do it. But for other things, I just don't. Yeah. I mean, right. I mean, even just the even just the configuration of the system in order for you to do that configuration in a system is not easy, and it takes a lot of work. And then you have to do it on an annual basis. And every time they make changes, you have to go back for configuration. It's an IT expense for us. I mean, there's there's a lot of variables that we need to consider. I think uh, the 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 founders of the blueprint would benefit from seeing that burden from an infrastructure perspective so that we can say, we'd love to give you this data, but it's not practical for us to have this burden on the staff, IT footprint, and all of those things on an annual basis to give you minute numbers in some places. So I think Ms. Thomas should have joined the CFO calls, the uh, Karen, because it's so interesting how she's wired because she goes into the right details of the work. I would say 
So we have conversations continuously with the AIB board that um, it was put in place to ensure that the blueprint law was, um, was implemented to its full. Um, the chief financial officers from all the 24 school systems come together and it's been huge work and you just outlined what people don't see in terms of making these shifts, the amount of time that all of these folks have had to change huge infrastructures to be able to do that and, and at a cost where even at the state level it hasn't fully been, I would say, um, thought through all the way. That ROI but I would important. tell you that the AIB board mm -hmm. um, would say that this is a necessary shift and it's a difficult shift but a necessary shift to make sure that the accounting of the funding actually follows the student because there's, there was no, unless you were Baltimore City that did fair student funding years ago with ERS and everything else, there's very few educational institutions or school systems that have that sort of, the, that can account to that level of detail. So, you know, I, I would channel AIB to say we have to guarantee that we're talking about equity um, and the way that the blueprint funding is meant to do that and the only way we can do that is if we can um, follow the money correctly and see whether it does get there or doesn't get there. Um, but it is, as you mentioned, and I think these folks would, would tell you, it, is, it has been a Herculean tax uh, to ask to change the infrastructure of these systems um, to be able to do this and to implement it. I will tell you, while we have to have this in place, the, the next level of conversation that we plan to have with the board around what does this mean in our schools, because there's a, there's a funding implication, there's a budget spreadsheet implication of whether did you do it, did you not, this is how much school A gets, are you funding it to that amount, um, it's the what are we going to do that I think we're also on the hook, uh, frankly, um, to start showing that we are making some of these major changes and reform efforts in the school system. And that's sort of part two of this presentation that we'll be bringing to you once the team that we have assembled sort of puts their head together and comes up with the best recommendations on what we do moving forward. And thank you, Dr. Navarro. And, and I'm not suggesting that we not do this funding. Like I understand the fundamental reason why, but I, I think it's important for people to understand the consultation hours that it takes for an IT person to come in and do the configuration. It's at the tune of about $150 an hour. And that's configuration that you may have an expense every year so someone has to take that expense. Is it our district that takes that burden? Or is that something that we look to the state to say, you know, maybe they benchmark and say, here's, here's the configuration for you. And they give the configuration to everybody. You don't have to pay for it. You put that configuration in your system and then everybody has something. So I mean, there's some things that they could do to help everybody, but I don't think they'll think of those things if we don't express the concern around those types of details when it comes to being able to comply with what they're asking. AIB has been very responsive to many of our requests. Um, when we had to submit our blueprint implementation plan last year, um, we were giving them back data that we had already submitted to them for years. And it's frustrating to have to go to this person for this data and I'm going to this person for, you know. Um, and so we've been, we, I mean, we've cried, complained, and, you know, yelled, frankly. Um, and this year, knock on wood, they say that um, this data that we would have to create for the upcoming report is going to be included in our template already. So they are responsive to um, some of our concerns and our, our comments and such. But as Dr. Navarro said, it is this change of thinking. And they are very much focused on this equity lens and ensuring that the money does follow the student. Um, so certainly um, we do keep a list and we do debrief with AIB. They sit on our calls with Pazam um, once a month, which is very nice. Um, so we do 
we are very vocal and I'm sure the CFO meetings are and equally it, as right a of AIB is on our CFO calls so they hear the complaints concerns all of that right thank you yeah. all right thank <coughs> you very much So uh, on the agenda is the board handbook, and um, I'm not anticipating a lot of discussion right now, but it's there for everybody to see. Apologies, it got posted a little later. Um, it got posted today, in advice last week. But um, we talked about a bunch of things at our retreat, and, and I think all those are captured here. So if they're not, please let me know. And Ms. Smith, I don't know if you, I'm guessing, I'm, no, okay. So Ms. Smith may have some things to add. Uh, in full disclosure, that's not to say that you, Chairman, did not give me ample time to mm -hmm. include my edits. However, they are now being included on the SharePoint site, so they are not on what we have yeah. in board oh. docs. And that, yeah, and, and if you could, I ask that you send it to me rather than make the change in the SharePoint site, because if nine people make a change, it's going to be impossible to... <laughs> To have any kind of configuration control. So if there's a topic that's not included there that, that we discussed at the retreat, um, please let me know and, and we'll put it in there and, and we can have it ready for the next time we get together. And it's a living document, you know, and, and yeah. we, can, we can change it. Uh, Ms. Butler Washington. Um, it was uh, up under the um, at board meetings, the last bullet, Personal devices should not be used on board members except family safe, uh, safety concerns or emergency. We stated that uh, I am on call at all times, so therefore that would not work for me. So, can we, <laughs> page 11. Yeah. Okay. Miss Washington. Right, so I, yeah, I mean, so this says, and, and I remember the conversation. Mm -hmm. Sure, you can have your cell phone, except for family concerns or emergencies, and if those are related to work, sure, that, that, that's fine. Okay, it's well, not, not, it doesn't say that. I, I just rather say it in there, work. Sure, yeah. sure. And then um, page 11. Yeah, got it. And then up on the board member district, um, we have discussion on uh, whether uh, uh, board members will receive assistance from CCPS staff to include the superintendent to conduct district meeting. The next sentence says the superintendent may attend district meetings at his or her schedule permit, as permit. So if we strike after staff, she still has the right to say yes or no. So it doesn't need to say to include the superintendent to conduct district meetings. When at the next center, she says the, the superintendent may attend. District so, district so that so, so there's two different things there. So one is is the the preparation, if you will, for for the event. So, if, so if a board member would like to have something in their district, um, that's fine. But it's it's on on the, the board member should not and. If I'm wrong here, the, the board member should not be able to, to task the superintendent or staff with providing assistance in, in having that meeting. Um, right. So, so stop, next sentence. Mm -hmm. All that notwithstanding, the superintendent can still come to that meeting right. as long as it, as it meets the superintendent's schedule. Okay. Yeah. Right. That, is that That's right. answer yeah, your yeah, question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, and if there's anything else, you know, just uh, we, can, we can revisit it and you can read it again. Um, I tried to catch all of the typos and things that are in there and we can, uh, we can talk about it at the next meeting. So this one here is that, that we're looking at that was included. That's the, the latest one, but should we hold review until we get these additional edits? Is that what you're saying? So, if you don't have it, she may not have it. So oh, there's I, a SharePoint site where okay. if you make changes, they're updated real time. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you not to do that. Okay. <laughs> Take this, 
And if you have, if there's a topic that's not there, let me know or, or, or make edits to that and, and send it, it back to me. Okay. And, and that, because otherwise we'll have nine people making changes and certainly, thank you. Yeah, be on top of each other. Yeah, Shelly disabled the editing. Oh, ah. <laughs> good so job. Okay, <laughs> okay. Okay. I think Ms. Smith and Mr. Lucas. All right, fair enough. All right. Good with that. So, uh, next thing on the agenda, which we discussed last meeting, is a uh, resolution for National Special Education Day. So, I'd like to make a motion that we approve this resolution. Second. Made by Mr. Hancock, seconded by Ms. Morley. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. That's unanimous to include the student. Mm -hmm. All right, and last. Mr. Lucas, if I may, um, I know that we, um, we wanted to present the National Special Education Day. It's on December 2nd this year, and I was wondering if you uh, and the board would give um, me a special permission to be able to uh, formally um, present a resolution maybe later this week and, and see if Ms. Smith can join me and we can get some, because if we do it at the December meeting, it will have already passed and we were trying to see if we could maybe do an, sure. um, a picture opportunity and formally present it like we did for sure. the previous resolution. Yeah, that's okay with the board? Yeah. 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 Just really, I'm not sure if this is an amendment or just a request. Um, in presenting that, is it possible to have educators, staff, like? Yeah, so yeah, we could work community. together to invite some folks and try to get, because uh, Shelly's going to want a big picture, yeah. and so we'd like to get some uh, parents and, yeah. Just let the board know when and where that happens. Yep. Yeah, we can and attend. if we could, too, Dr. Navarro, include um, a representative from CCAC, CCAC. Um, yes. and specifically maybe reach out to Ms. Sapp, because I know that you know she worked directly with us in, in yes. drafting this so we'd like if possible or to have someone at least from CCAC so right, to represent I will have um, Mr. Lowndes and um, his staff work on it because we will have um, we were trying to work around their schedule and then work with um, to have board members as many board members potentially come that they want to do Absolutely. so yep so we'll work on it tomorrow and let everybody know before the weekend sorry for the short notice all oh, good all good. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> 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 motion to adjourn made by Ms. Thomas and seconded by Mr. Hancock. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And it's yes. unanimous. So have a you good did. night. I second it. One, one more thing, if I could. Uh, this Saturday, this Saturday, North Point High School football team is playing for the state championship. Uh, it's at 3.30, I believe in Annapolis, so it's supposed to be good weather. <laughs>